You're watching Fox Sports. Home to the World Series. Super Bowl 36. And now, the 43rd running of the Great American Race. The Daytona 500. The thing about Daytona and what it means to most of us drivers is this is our premier race. This is our Super Bowl. We call this the Great American Race. You know, this track was built in 1959. It was the first of the super speedways. Nobody had ever seen anything like this. Your heart's pounding. The fans are coming in the stands. People are hollering, you know, and the crews are revving up their air guns. Well, they drop that green flag, buddy, and you head off into that first turn. And everybody is jockeying for position, and the track's dirty, and it's just flying, and it's covering up your windshield, and you're trying to find a hole to get in, and all of a sudden you realize, I'm sitting on a hot rod today, boys. I'm going to the front, and I'm going to win this thing. It is your moment. This is your time, and it's all about you. It's all about what you've just done. We all drive into the victory circle, and victory circle is it's like heaven. I mean, it's open the gates. When they get there, they open the gates, and you drive in, and that's when everything comes into perspective. We won the race. The nation's outstanding race drivers will be after a rich $1,200 purse. In the middle of the last century, the legendary drivers of Daytona blazed a trail along this Florida beach. They raced with the love of a roaring engine and for the thrill of every sandy turn. But as these burly V8s raced on, the storied sand would soon be replaced by the grandest super speedway in the land. Here in the birthplace of speed, the moments have been many, the images awesome. In the sport where father faces son, today's best respect the history of the great American race. Because if one can raise his arms here in this victory lane, he can forever ride on racing center stage. Now I think I got the crew, the team, the car, the engine combination, everything to win the Daytona 500. The thing about the Daytona 500 is you're nobody unless you've won the Daytona 500. Man and machine, power and pride, drive and thrive. Jarrett, Gordon, Burton, and of course, the Intimidator. Fox and NASCAR fly together right into the future as the world's fastest sport has arrived right here on the one and only Fox Sports. Today. Welcome back to what many people and drivers are saying will be the greatest Daytona 500 ever. Speaking of great, this weekend we had one of the greatest quarterbacks to ever play the game with us. Fox's own Terry Bradshaw stopped by. Last night, Terry and Dale Earnhardt tried to give us a little tour of this historic track, but it turned into a bad episode of the Dukes of Hazard. Well, folks, I'm Terry Bradshaw, and I'm here at the birthplace of speed, Daytona Beach, Florida. Now, it's about time, about time, Fox got me away from that studio and that football crowd and got me around my kind of people. NASCAR, you got Winston Cup. I want to be on the track, and I want someone to drive me around that track. And who better than the Intimidator? I ain't talking about Daryl Walter, either. He turned into a wussy. He's up there in the old press box. I'm talking about Dale Earnhardt. I'm going to go ask him if you give me a ride. Hey, you know, got all this stuff. Sure hope Dale lets me drive. I don't think he will. Sure hope he does. Put your helmet on. Let's go. Our team money. You got to stay out of this line coming off pit road. All right. Why am I nervous? You know, you shouldn't be. I shouldn't be? No. Nah. What about turn three, Dale? What's the special or the hard? All right. This is where I like to race if there's no, if I'm in line, if there's nobody but, you know, side by side. We get a car side by side, and you're, you're running a high lane. And you got to run up here, and the guys are down on the inside of you. And you get way up here on the high lane like this. Shame, buddy. Christmas, this is not fun. It is. It's cool, man. No. Now, we're doing it in race cars. This is a dang old street car. Now, what's bad about this? The great track falls what's out. Bad about this? It falls out. Just the instant. You don't want to go there and catch the apron too quick on you losing, do you? Holy! Let's be it. All right. I love the camera. 
I know if Victory Lane's here, you would like to be crossing that line first. first and then spin and around then the infield. Spin around the infield. And then go to Victory Lane. Then go to Victory Lane, which is where I'll be doing the interviews. Oh, you going to be here? Yeah. What do you mean about being here? <laughs> Fox brought their A-team in here, babe. <laughs> Good luck I'm tomorrow. off lucky when you're around. You remember you that? You know that. You know it, don't you? One year ago, Steve Dale Earnhardt less than confident with the current rules package to win his second Daytona 500, but he won the last plate race of 2000, and Dale looking very strong during Speed Weeks. Can you win your second 500 today? Well, we got a good shot at it. Got a good race car. Uh, wasn't really excited about the car yesterday afternoon, the last practice, but the car it come around. I think it's going to be okay. We've got a good engine in it, but a uh, little wind today. A little exciting. I think it's going to be some exciting racing. Uh, going to see something you probably hadn't ever seen on Fox. The seven-time champ rolls off seven today. Jeannie. Why have over 200,000 people today filled Daytona International Speedway? Because minutes from now, 43 common men will fire their engines and become capable of performing uncommon deeds. They'll race these cars at 190 miles an hour closer together than we dare to park. And at the end of 500 miles, a million dollars and immortality await the winner. Here at Day I'm going with the man who Come has on. won more races here at Daytona than anybody in history. Dale Earnhardt, the Intimidator, will pull into victory lane when the checkered flag falls. Steve, the sentimental favorite would have to be Kyle Petty, but I think the man who is rumored to see the air, if he finds luck today, Dale Earnhardt, And now to honor America from the hit television series, Making the Band, J Records recording artist, O-Town. Oh, say can you see So proudly we hailed at the twilight last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallant. UPS employees around the world. Gentlemen, start your engines! Race fans, 
Teams have waited all winter for this. Race teams have worked many, many months for this moment to start the Daytona 500. Hi, everyone. Mike Joy with the 1989 winner of this race, Darrell Waltrip, after 17 years of trying. And Larry McReynolds, who's been to victory lane in the 500 twice as a crew chief. Gentlemen, what does it mean to win the single biggest race in NASCAR? Well, as a little boy, I, I, I heard about Daytona. And as a young race driver, I dreamed about racing at Daytona. And then I dreamed about winning at Daytona. It took a long time. Some dreams turn into nightmares, like some of these guys have had happen to them. But there's no greater feeling, no greater accomplishment than driving your car through those pearly gates into that holy ground. In 20 years, I was a part of winning 23 Winston Cup races, but none can even come close to going to victory lane here with Davey Allison in 1992 and Dale Earnhardt in 1998. And one of the most precious moments is when they slid this ring on my finger and said, you're the winning crew chief of the Super Bowl, the Daytona 500. That's the feel of what it's like. We'll help bring you that feeling throughout the day and throughout the first half of this NASCAR season on Fox. Frankie Muniz from the uh, Fox Sunday night hit Malcolm in the middle. He's going to get a big ride here. He's uh, riding shotgun in the safety car. That'll pace this field on its first preliminary lap. Getting set for the start of the Daytona 500. Whose face will grace victory lane today? You're watching live the Daytona International Speedway. Built in 1959, it's two and a half miles around. Those corners right there, turn four. Banked a steep 31 degrees. The trioval you see right at the start finish line where the cars are now is banked 18 degrees, just about like the roof on a ranch house. Let's have a look at the UPS starting grid for today's Daytona 500. Bill Elliott has his fourth pole for the great race. First time at a Dodge and Stacey Compton, his first front row start ever. Row two, two-time 500 winner Sterling Marlin and Thursday's qualifying race winner Mike Skinner. Row three, Jerry Nadeau having a little fun here. Last fall's Atlanta winner and Dale Earnhardt Jr. a close second in the Twins Thursday. There's the intimidator Dale Earnhardt, the 98 champion of the 500 and last year's runner-up. Jeff Burton, Andy Houston is a rookie. Ward Burton, last year's Darlington winner, 05. In the sixth row, former Pepsi 400 winner Jimmy Spencer and Rusty Wallace, who's not yet won a restrictor plate race, maybe today. Row seven, Jeff Gordon, the 97 and 99 500 champ, and Ken Schrader, who has seven top 10 finishes in this race. Jason Leffler makes his Winston Cup debut. He's out of USAC Midget Racing, and last year's rookie of the year, Matt Kenton. Jeff Purvis in the big dance for the first time in five years. And Ricky Craven, who finished third here in 97. Michael Waltrip, fifth in 1999. And Dave Blaney in his second 500. Youngest driver in the field, Casey Atwood, age 20. And Mark Martin, third in 1995, his best finish. Kenny Wallace just picked up a sponsor this morning for that car. Six start for the veteran. And Tony Stewart, who won six races last year. Steve Park, last year's Watkins Glen winner, and Kurt Busch, the rookie from the NASCAR Truck Series. Mike Wallace, the middle of the three racing brothers from St. Louis, and there's Kyle Petty carrying Sun Adams colors. Row 15, Buckshot Jones racing for the Petties, and Ricky Rudd finished third way back in 81. Dale Jarrett is the defending champion of the 500. Joe Nemechek makes his seventh start in this race. Johnny Benson, who led last year until five laps to go. There, he's still saying, what happened? Terry Labonte, the Iceman, two-time Winston Cup champ. Bobby, Labon Bobby Hamilton, 11th, Daytona 500 start. And John Andretti, who won here in July 97. There's the Winston Cup champ, Bobby Labonte, second in 1998. Jeremy Mayfield ran third in that year's race. Robert Presley makes his eighth 500 start. And from Virginia, Elliott Sadler, his third 500. Robbie Gordon made his Winston Cup debut here in 1991. The Open Wheeler joins truck champ Ron Hornaday. Finally, Brett Bodine gets the last provisional start, the 13-year veteran from New York State. Today, 43 cars will try to complete the 200-lap, 500-mile distance. Posted awards, $11 million. They can go 45 to 55 laps on a tank of fuel, and let's go trackside to Steve Burns.
Mike, Jeff Gordon blew his Daytona 500 motor in the final practice yesterday. This morning at 6 a.m., the team had to decide between one of three motors. They agonized over the decision. We're about to find out if they've made the right one. Let's go to Matt Yoakum. Steve Dale Earnhardt is the most prolific restrictor plate driver in NASCAR history. 11 wins and only 52 plate starts. He's chasing his second 500 victory, looking to bookend what's been a legendary Daytona career. He was second in the Bud Shootout, third in his 125. Today, Chasing his 35th total victory here in Daytona. Jeannie Zelasco. Well, Matt, 31st may be the farthest back a defending champ has ever started, but for Dale Jarrett, that's just fine. For him, this is not the Daytona 500. This is the Daytona 100. He plans on making his move in those last 100 laps. He just told me he expects trouble out in front. He has no problem hanging back and waiting to make that move. It's the coolest day of speed weeks, Larry. 68 degrees. Track temperature, though, 97 on the asphalt. That's definitely a key number right there because the sun's out. And the more the sun stays out, the hotter the track gets. gets slicker and greasier, and these cars won't stick. Yeah, I know since I'm driving around here that, uh, my, you know, my car's slipping around already. I got stickers on. I'm starting back here in the back, and I had to buff them up a little bit. But the uh, car feels pretty good. I got all my switches up. Gauges look good. Water's up to 180 right now. Got about 80 pounds of oil pressure. Getting ready to come to the line, guys. Let's all have a good day. Why you say? All right, Ron Hornaday has our Conseco cam. Dale Jarrett, the UPS cam, starting 31st. Ricky Rudd, our Texaco Haviland on board, starting 30th. Tony Stewart, the Home Depot cam, sits 24th on the grid. Mark Martin, our Viagra Pfizer cam from 22nd starting spot. Our Napa onboard camera rides with Michael Waltrip, going from 19th position. Our GM Goodrich cam from 7th place with Dale Earnhardt. And the Bud Cam, on board his son's car, Dale Earnhardt Jr., starts sixth. The Lowe's camera rides with Mike Skinner from fourth position and will ride with the pole sitter Bill Elliott in our Dodge onboard camera. Oh, man. Pace vehicle is in. The 43rd annual Daytona 500 is set to get underway. Terry Bradshaw waves the green flag. We're racing. Two Dodgers up front, Bill Elliott and Stacey Compton got a well of a start, and these guys have not been comfortable with their cars. So I'm anxious to see if they can stay up there. Yeah, and they haven't been on the racetrack together either, so that's, uh, you know, that's something they set up prior to the start of the day's race. What happened to that second row? It looked like Sterling Marlin did not come up through the gears quickly. Boy, when somebody in front of you doesn't go, it really backs the field up right on the start like that. They're not wasting time. They're three wide, four wide down the back straightaway. There goes teammates Mike Skinner in the 31, Dale Earnhardt in the black three. I think what we saw, the same thing we saw in the 125s, uh, getting a big jump on a restart is not necessarily an advantage. From fourth starting spot, here comes Skinner on the outside trying to lead lap one. He's past Compton. He's caught Elliott. Elliott drops low to lead the first lap. Charlie Marlin's right there, too, looking on the outside. He's got Dale Jr. pushing him. I know Bill's intentions are to try to stay up front if he can. That's what his plan was. I talked to him earlier, and he said, if I can hold this thing out front, that's what I want to do. Boy, Earnhardt's back in the sucker hole early. Whew. Sterling Marlin on the outside for the lead. Well, maybe not. They get, <laughs> they're in no sucker hole yet, because they're all over the place. Three wide in the back straightaway. We heard Earnhardt yesterday say in practice that his car wouldn't pull up like it had been. And, Larry, we've got a tremendous headwind down the back straightaway today. And it'll make those guys think, hey, my motor don't seem to be running. I'm not seeing the RPMs, but it's because that wind is buffeting that car, and it's almost just like running against a brick wall. Sterling Marlin, the lead lap two. We have every reasonable hope of a record number of lead changes for this race today. Talking about that wind up the back, what a driver looks at is his tachometer. When he looks down at his tack and he's, I've been turning 7,000 all weekend long. What have y'all done to me? I'm 6,800. This thing won't run. And of course, what's the crew chief saying, Larry? I'm telling you, you got you got a headwind down at back stretch, but this is wind-wise, it's similar to conditions to what these guys had in half the hour. So that's one thing that's not a curve thrown at them today. Earnhardt backing up. The battle's on point. Marlin has company 99. Jeff Burton. And eight, Earnhardt Jr. Talking to some of the drivers, some of these cars are pretty free, pretty loose on new tires on the start. And uh, that'll make them fast. Some of the other cars are a little tighter, and that'll make them slow. 
what they'll do, they'll start these cars low on air pressure because as they run and the heat builds in the tires, the air pressure builds up. Yeah, it will. The, the rear end wheel will to come around when the air pressure's down. It's like driving on a low tire on your passenger car. You can feel the low tire wobbling around. They won't be that way long, I can tell you that. Sterling Marlin in his 20th 500 appearance. He's won twice, and he's now led in 12 of those 20 starts. It don't matter who's leading. We still got a 43-car lead draft. Jeff Gordon has fallen from 13th to 24th. Earnhardt from 7th back to 13th. Challenge up front. New leader, Dale Earnhardt Jr. Bill Senior down on the inside making a move on the Bill Elliott as they head down toward turn one. This is where the cars have really been aggressive. The guys have really been using that bottom uh, apron down there to get a position on guys going into turn one. It's been kind of breathtaking. Even up here. Well, if I'd have started, if I'd have been up here two or three years ago watching these guys, I'd have retired then. Drivers have tunnel vision. You basically see what's going on right in front of you, and it's up to the spotters and everybody else to see what's going on around and behind you. And they ain't been telling me the truth. <laughs> Three abreast. Elliott caught in the middle now. Marlin fights his way back to the front. Earnhardt is leading that high line around. Mike Skinner right behind him. And then rookie Andy Houston. And Sterling Marlin is back out front again, guys. That car at Cruz, one thing, that 125 win was no fluke. It wasn't all about just being in the right place at the right time. He's got a pretty fast hot rod there. Tony Stewart trying to climb the ladder. He's 19th right now. Pulls alongside Jason Leffler. That's Mark Martin just in front of him. Tony Stewart has patience written on his dashboard. They made it bigger for the race today. Yeah. <laughs> Takes up the whole dashboard today because he is not a patient driver. He's a very aggressive driver. just leads Rusty Wallace now on the inside. Wallace has spun his way up into the top three in car two. Now they got Jeff Burton in that 99 car caught in the middle. A little help from behind, but the outside row and the inside row is the ones that are moving. That's right, because when you're in the middle like that, you're bu the wind's buffing off of all the cars. It really slows you down. Rusty Wallace has never won a restrictor plate race at Daytona. He has come from 12th on the grid to second and brought Earnhardt back up front with him. When you're in the middle, as a driver, you're saying, give me Get me a hoe. I got to get in somewhere. And they're saying there is no hoe. You're going to be 43rd when you finally get in line again. And the thing about it is, Mike, I, I, that's it. the driver panics. He's in there. He knows he's losing spots. And he knows he can. it's going to take him forever to work his way back up there. So it takes uh, the crew chief to calm him down. I can't but help but notice the front of the roof here on Earnhardt's car. It's like it's buffeting. It's because Rusty Wallace, the car in front of him, with that roof flap across the roof or that roof fin, it's putting dirty air, and it's making the air on Earnhardt's car mad. It don't know what to do. No, and that's right. It's the cowl opening, I believe. And that, that'll make an engine run terrible because it, it messes up the airflow into the air box that leads to the carburetor. Now it's Jerry Nadu pulling the outside train. Out there in lane two, Jeff Gordon right behind him and Ricky Craven. Nobody can do anything with Marlin. He's just sitting there kind of pulling these cats around. And, uh, you know, Dale's uh, figured out he doesn't want to be on the outside. He wants to be on the bottom today because he went way back, about eighth or ninth, but he's worked his way back up there in the top four or five. Pole sitter Bill Elliott has drifted back to 21st. Dick Berger? Ten different, ten different teams changed engines for this race. One of them is Rusty Wallace in the number two car. He is coming into this race with an engine that is just barely going to make 500 miles. They did not want to start with an engine that had any miles on it at all. That's how hard they're pressuring to win this event. These restrictor plate engines, they build them it with light parts, light rods, light pistons, small bearings. Friction is a big enemy of a restrictor plate engine. So they try to keep everything as free as they can in the motors, but 500 miles is a real stretch for the parts they've got in these engines. John Andretti started 36th up to 13th, the biggest gainer in the field. Here goes Earnhardt to the inside on Wallace. And he's got some push from behind, so there's a good chance he's going to get right up on the Sterling before they get to the end of the back straightaway. They do leads briefly in the 25. There's Gordon with his new engine up there. You know, he had an engine failure yesterday afternoon, and there he is right in the front of the pack. So uh, made a good call, changed that thing. He was really lucky. Jerry Nadu trying to become the fourth different leader of the Daytona 500 in just nine laps. Nope. Marlon hangs on to it. Oh, by inch 
to ever so close. And why do these guys fight so hard to lead a lap? Because even though it's race one of 36 races, every time when, when you lead a lap in a race, it's worth five bonus points toward the Winston Cup Championship. And you got to look at the big picture. This is a one race for the whole year. Danbury, Connecticut's Jerry Nadeau battles Sterling Marlin for the lead in the Daytona 500. Nine of 200 laps complete. This is NASCAR on Fox. The Daytona 500 on Fox is brought to you by Dodge and nearly 3,000 dealers who invite you to come see what's different. By Visa, the preferred card of NASCAR. Visa, it's everywhere NASCAR fans want to be. By Conseco. And by Budweiser, with the crisp, clean, refreshing taste you'll find in no other beer. This Bud's for you. 12 laps in, Sterling Marlin still leads in the Daytona 500. This year's Bud Pole Award for the race, presented by Anheuser-Busch, to Dodge's Bill Elliott, who won the pole in last Saturday's qualifying. But congratulations, Bill Elliott and his team. But he is slipping back. 18th position right now. You can see how he has drifted back from the pole. Yeah, you know, uh, I think Chip Ganassi's probably calling Juan Marlin because he'll be calling him Juan before this over if he keeps running this way after his IndyCar driver, Juan Montoya. Boy, Ron Hornaday started 42nd, and the two-time Truck Series champion has climbed to fifth place goes to show you get in the right line you'll go to the front oh yeah and coming from the back is uh, sometimes a little easier than starting out front and we look at a lot of things here of course miles power rpms but look at the throttle right here you see the, the key to getting around here is going wide open see as he went off in the corner he backed off just a little bit and as the tires deteriorate the handling goes away more and more in the corner they'll have to back off the throttle you get the car to go through the tunnel through the through the corners till they get fresh tires put on that thing you see it doesn't lose many RPMs, up to 7,000 through the trial over right there. And up to third place. And I'm telling the crew chief, he's saying, are you holding that thing wide open? Oh, yes, sir. I ain't, I'm, li I'm not lifting it. I, I've had her on the mat ever since we started. Sometimes you lift and you don't even know it. Sometimes the thing is uh, you lift up a little and don't know it. We got a lead change. All right. Ward Burton drops down the hill in turn two to try to take the lead from Marlin. A lot of it depends on how much drafting help he's got going into turn three. Well, that 14 has given Marlin the best push. And uh, here comes Skinner down there behind that 22 car. So uh, that old boy, that was the right move right there for Horner Day to drop down in front of 22. Now outside bull sitter Stacy Compton has dropped back to 13th, Matt. Mike, coming into today's race, NASCAR has a rule here in Daytona. The top two qualifiers, their tires are impounded. Those two cars have to start on their tires. Stacy Compton's tires before qualifying had 20 laps of practice on them. So now he has 22 laps starting on his tires, where tire wear has been a main concern all week, pulling a number of crew chiefs. So Stacy Compton right now is patiently just riding, waiting to the first pit stop, which should be around lap 50. Steve? Well, Matt, moments ago, Dick Bergen talked about how tightly wound that motor is in the number two of Rusty Wallace. Rusty has a teammate in Jeremy Mayfield on the 12 and a partner in Robert Presley in the 77. Between those three teams, they have been through nine motors during Speed Weeks. In fact, the motors have made two trips back and forth from Daytona to Mooresville, North Carolina to get worked on. Let's go to Dick Bergen. Ron Hornaday in the number 14 car, an incredible run this afternoon. He's currently running right around fifth position. That car was virtually demolished in a qualifying race here on Thursday. They flew a new door in. They flew in sheet metal equipment so they could rebuild it. The whole side of that car was redone here in the garage, repainted. They just crossed their fingers. They got it right. Looks like they did, Mike. Hornaday looks pretty good, but he is about to become the meat in the sandwich. He got he got in the wrong line. He made all the right moves to get to the front, but it's hard to stay there. But you go the wrong way, and he's an aggressive driver, and he didn't want to follow, and uh, he made a move there, and he got passed. And now he's going to slide right on back to where he started. And I know for a crew chief, and it's got to be for a driver, people don't realize you have a millisecond to make that decision which line you want to get in. Sometimes it's right, sometimes it's wrong. It's like running into somebody in a hallway. You know, they're going one way, you're going the other. But you're doing 190 mile an hour, and you don't know which way you want to go. That's what causes the cars to move around the way they do. You run up on the guy, you go left, go right. No, I can't go anywhere. 
are Dale Jarrett and Bobby Labonte running 31st and 32nd. Are those cars off or are they biding their time? I don't know. It's not like Dale Jarrett to buy his time because sometimes you can get more trouble in the back. Jenny, what's going on with that 88 car? Well, very interesting because early out on the track, Dale was complaining that the car was a little tight. They've been trying to talk him through that. But just moments ago, they said, hey, Dale, don't get too far away from the draft. And very confidently, he responded, look, I can get up there anytime I want to. He knows this track. He's confident, guys. Last year, he won the 500. The year before, he was in the middle of the pack. And before halfway, got turned over. I talked to Bobby Labonte this morning. He said his car wasn't handling very good in the 125s. He said, but I couldn't even let off enough to stay out of the draft. It's just sucking him along so fast. Let's explain the word tight. What that means is through the corner, he's turning the wheel, but the front wheels aren't biting like they should. And a lot of times when you're behind the car, Daryl, it takes the front down force off the nose, and the front end won't lift from an arrow standpoint, so you can create two problems there. Yeah, if pushing is better than loose. If the car is pushing, that means you got the wheels turned left, and that's the direction you want to be going in. And you can control that a little better with the throttle, but if you got somebody right up on your back bumper all the time and you lift out that throttle, guess what's going to happen to you? They're going to boot you in the rear end and turn you around. Dodges have led 18 of the 19 laps, including the first one from Bill Elliott. Last Dodge to lead the first lap of the 500, Buddy Baker, the pole winner in 1973. Here, I'm going to show you what tight is. Watch this guy go through the corner. Watch his hand position. He pushes up the hill. He goes up the racetrack. That means he's turning the car, but it won't turn the way where he wants it to. See how much effort it takes? See all that steering input he has to put into it? It's oversteer. He can't get it to turn. The only thing you can do most of the time is back off the throttle. No, 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 that's not the only thing down. you can do. You can call your crew chief and raise <laughs> That's all you can do. What have you done to my car, boy? Now watch, look at Mikey, look at Mikey. He's got a handful, that's what we call a handful. When you get the wheel pulled way around there like that, he's got a he's got a handful of steering wheel, he's a little too tight. And you can see he's not going very fast. Tight bogs the motor down. Lead change, Ward Burton up on the high side this time may get the lead from Sterling Marlin. Boy, Sterling does not want to relinquish that lead. He is just hanging on. Two dodges there, gang, side by side. And old Jerry Nadeau just kind of slipping along. And we've had several drivers lead through turns one and two, but official lead changes are only counted at the start-finish line, and each time, Martin has held off the charge and beaten them back to the line. Not this time. He's got the push. 22's got the push this time. Come on, baby. Oh. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Ward Burton leads that lap. And First time he's ever led the 500. Four. That's four lead changes. Isn't that about as many as we had in the whole race last year? <laughs> What's changed, folks, is NASCAR has allowed the engines to run a little res less restricted and a new aerodynamics package that we'll explain when we come back. 21 laps complete in the Daytona 500. Sterling Marlin out in front. NASCAR Victory Lane every Sunday night at 9 p.m. on Fox Sports Net. Your new home for NASCAR. Look at the lead changes in this race as Earnhardt tries to make it another one. So far in this speed week, 45 lead changes among Winston Cup cars on the track racing. Last year in all of speed week, only 14. I was here one time. I had a car in 1988. It was so fast that nobody could pass it. Earnhardt to get up behind me like he is right now. I'd look back and his hands would be smoking. There'd be smoke coming off that steering wheel. His eyes would be about as big as a pair of binoculars. His teeth would be showing. That's incentive to keep out front. That's that look right now that he's giving Sterling Marlin. And here's all I can hear. Show you move Earnhardt. Put on Mike Skinner. Oh. Inside. Uh-huh. Inside. That's called the... Uh, on your back. Watch your back. That's Skinner Spotter telling him inside. The, well, the black yeah. car is inside. That's called a passing signal. <laughs> <laughs> Dick Bergeron. 
Mike Skinner and Dale Earnhardt traditionally, although they're partners, teammates, don't ordinarily work very well together on the racetrack. This Speed Weeks has been different than any we've seen before. They've spent a lot of time in the garage area talking back and forth, crew chiefs talking back and forth. We've seen them working better together on the racetrack than before. That could pay big dividends when this thing gets down to the end. Look at Earnhardt! Right down to the apron to take the lead. With Jeff Gordon pushing him in the 24 car, and Dale Earnhardt Jr. in the red car, the 8 car, pushing with him. Darrell, he was down there in the Bermuda Triangle for a while. i tell you one thing. Uh, I've been out there when uh, there were two Earnhardts here, and I've been out there long before now when I thought there was more than one Earnhardt on the track. I can tell you that. Earnhardt has now led in 19 of his 23 Daytona 500 starts. Jeff Hammond. Mike. Earlier this day, earlier today, I was take, talking to uh, Earnhardt's crew chief, and he told me then that he thought just like the 125, that they could get their car to the front, that they could comfortably lead this pack around here today. I don't think he'll stay there very long. Well, that 40 car did not like what happened to him. Chevy, Chevy, Dodge, Dodge. We're going to play dodgeball here as Marlin comes up behind Earnhardt. And he did it by himself yeah. without no help. Yeah. That 40 car, Sterling Marlin. Oh, uh, trouble up here in turn three and four. Two cars slide up against the wall and then get free. Something happened to that. Uh, it's Rusty Wallace Rusty in the Wallace. two car. I, he's got a right, in the five. I think he's got a right front down. He's trying to get to pit road. And he will without incident. We will stay green. Locking up the right oh. front. First pit stop of the day, unscheduled for Rusty Wallace. Right front tire, flat. Steve Burns. And Rusty Wallace off pit road. Smoke coming from the right front of that number two car. We understand he may have come down pit road too fast. Over 18 coming into the Daytona 500. 15 second penalty for Rusty Wallace. He's going to go a lap down with that. 15 seconds here. That's from here to eternity. Especially while they're out there under green, they're coming off four now. So he's definitely going to go one lap down, but you can't run faster than 55 miles an hour. And here Pam, they go by him right there. So he is one lap down, just 29 laps into this Daytona 500. But Larry, the good news is if he can get up to speed, he can hang, he can catch onto the back of this, car, this big draft right here. And if things work out for him, it's an early pit stop, but he can stay out longer than anybody else now. I'm glad it's my driver. You feeling that way? I'm we make this lap back up. It's the Daytona 500. Don't let me down now, baby. Keep me pumped up. But that's a tall order because with the tall gear these cars run, it takes them more than a full lap to get up to full speed. Well, you saw he came out right there with them, and they're just, uh, you know, kind of blowing a by him there. But he's got some cars to draft off of. I just, I don't know if he got into the fence or not, or if he got in that car beside him. They made some contact look like. And there's the damage to the tire, the inside of the right front on Rusty Wallace's car. Jeff? Mike, right now this is where Robin Pemberton is trying to get control of his driver once again and let him know that, hey, it's a long, long way before the end of this thing. Get caught back up. Everybody's got to make a pit stop and start cycling through. He still is not out of this race technically yet. He's probably trying to remotivate. Steve? And interesting, several members of other teams, Dale Jarrett's team, Mike Skinner's team, the 28 crew members down here, they're all looking at the tire. They want to know if there is a problem here on this tire. Five different teams down here looking. Listen, here's the, here's the, Rusty Wallace is notorious for this. Low air pressure and too much camber. Too much camber with the radial tire, that inside edge, that inside edge will dig like a knife. So what you try to do is you get you run that thing as much camber on the uh, inside that you can, but it destroys the sidewall of the tire. Low air pressure, too much camber. Here's what I'm talking about. This is an adjustment that they should have been, they should have made. There, you, you explain the camber. Well, camber's how much the, the front tire is leaned in at the top. And, and you, the problem is, is right in here, that's on the inside edge all the way down the straightway. It's what we call the footprint. It's running on the inside edge. But what you want to try to get is that full footprint in the corner on the ground, and that makes that car go through the corner because the whole tire is gripping the racetrack. Now, how do we fix that? Just a simple little adjustment. Put that spacer in there and lean that in that tire in there. But again, with these long straightaways, you can run on that inside too much, and that's what eats it up. And as we said, there's the tire. It says it's cut, and uh, it is, but it's cut over in the side. There, we got it covered up. Dale Earnhardt, Ward Burton, Mike Skinner, and Ron Hornaday has fought his way back to the front four, driving for A.J. Foyt. 
32 of 200 laps complete, and Earnhardt is out in front. You're watching NASCAR on Fox. 500. 1,000 feet above Daytona International Speedway, the Budweiser.com airship. Mike Skinner sits there third. Jerry Nadeau fourth. And then two rookies, KC Atwood and Andy Houston. That limp's got a pretty good view of the speedway, but the folks, I'm telling you, this is where you want to be right here. We got cameras everywhere. You can see every move these cars make. I've never been so excited about a Daytona 500. I hope I'm not overdoing it. Well, you talk about Casey Atwood in the red 19. I talked to Ray Evernham this morning, and he said, we we felt good about Casey's car yesterday. But Casey come in and said, Ray, this motor just didn't run. And he said, I started to question Casey. He said, but for 10 days, everything that kid has told me, he's been on the mark, and I wasn't going to doubt him about his motor. And let me tell you something else about him. He had to run. He had to run his way into this race through the 125. He didn't qualify well, and he drove a whale of a race in the 125. Bill, on the other hand, slid back. I don't believe Bill's been in a racing situation all weekend. Ward Burton's backed up. He's gone from second, now back to fifth, and the inside line is moving past him. There's a look at Bill Elliott, the pole sitter, who was all the way back to 42nd place, and just in front of him. Winston Cup champ Bobby Labonte in 39th and Dale Jarrett in 37th position. A lot of big guns running at the back of the field, Matt. And Mike, Gene Zelasco talked earlier about Dale Jarrett fitting to the back. Actually, in the driver's meeting, Dale, Bobby Labonte, and Johnny Benson struck a deal to when the green flag dropped to fade to the back and just let the race play out because of the new aero package with a strip across the top and the plate. They know they can get back up to the front. The one complaint, they are complaining about their cars being tight due to a crosswind off turn two. Lead change, Mike Skinner who won Thursday's qualifying race by four one-thousandths of a second. He has gone to the front. Seven lead changes in 38 laps last year. Only nine lead changes in the whole Daytona 500. I made this statement a year ago. Got a little bit of trouble. They didn't need seats in the grandstands a year ago. They needed to put cots because everybody was going to go to sleep. This year, they don't even need seats because nobody's sitting down up here. A new aerodynamic package. Look from the back of Mike Skinner's car and look at the roof of Jerry Nadeau and see that strip that runs right across the top of the roof. And that's something we didn't have a year ago, but what that's doing is poking a bigger hole in there and that's what's allowing these cars to pull up and make a pass. Also, they have 70 degrees of spore on them versus 45 degrees last year. A lot more drag in the car, a lot more downforce. Then under the hood, the plate is a 32nd of an inch bigger than a year ago. That don't sound like much, but that's about 25 to 30 horsepower. Hey, 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 man, my, my kid, my kid there from Nashville is trying to get out in the front. He's almost, he was up there with Skinner. He's on the outside. He's running third. 20-year-old Casey Atwood. He's a rookie. Last year here in the Bush race turned over. This year he's up there fighting for the lead in the Daytona 500. Mike Skinner, the reason he's moving back and forth, he's trying to see which one of those lines is going to come with him. He don't want to get suckered by by the whole line on the high or the low. But, Dick, what's happening with the black three? He's just called in, Larry, and he has said that the wind of the backstretch is just killing him. It bothered him last night as well during the final practice session. They changed intake, carburetor, and even the oil cooler on that race car. He didn't get the job done. To that. So Tommy Baldwin just talking to Ward Burton. They would like to pit around lap 50 to kind of get a gauge on their fuel mileage because last Sunday in the Bud shootout, some teams were not getting the mileage they had hoped, Steve Burns. Matt, we just listened to Royce McGee, the rookie crew chief for Mike Skinner. Mike Skinner is complaining about the car being a little bit loose. They're going to add wedge to the car. They're going to pit in about 10 laps if this race stays green. Now, Rusty Wallace is right with that lead pack car, too. Fourth car on the bottom lane. He is one lap down due to the pit stop, trying to get back on the lead lap. And I think he can. i tell you why. These cars are starting to, tires are going off on them. They're starting to have to lift in the corners. It's backing everybody up. And Rusty's got fresher tires. He gets out front. He's back in the race. Now, where Rusty wants to see here, we're about 10 to 12 laps before green flag stops. He wants it to cycle through. That way, when everybody pits, and I think we got another lead change, Sterling Marlin is back to the front of the field. Marlin just drove under Mike Skinner, and Marlin retakes the lead. Mike Wallace has climbed 
up to fourth place. Where did he come from? He came from 27th starting spot. 41 laps complete in the Daytona 500 on Fox. This is brought to you by UPS, the official delivery company of NASCAR. We want to race the truck. People love the truck. Welcome back to Daytona, where Mike Skinner now leads 20-year-old rookie Casey Atwood and another rookie right behind him, Andy Houston. Then Mike Wallace, who has pulled big brother Rusty up into the lead draft after Rusty had to make an unscheduled pit stop for a flat tire. Right now, everybody is really, really working hard because they're close to a pit stop. Tires are going off. The wind is pushing them like crazy up turn two over there. Jeff Hammond. Yeah, Mike, we're talking about Rusty Wallace. Rusty had a little bit of a problem early on. Cut a tire down, had to get up and get out of the way and make an unset scheduled stop. But when he came down pit road, he's coming down so hot, he actually sped down pit road, even though he had a flat tire. As you see coming in here, got him all smoking. Couldn't get it slowed up quick enough. He got penalized. 15 seconds for speeding on pit road. So therefore, uh, Robin Pemberton, his crew chief, had to get back on the radio and let him know, look, cut a tire down, everything's okay. It's a long, long way to the end of this race. Just keep digging, baby. We'll get back in this race. And now you see Rusty's up with the lead pack. And if everything cycles through, he's going to get back on the lead pack, on the lead lap. Everything goes according to their plans. They may get a caution. And he'll be back in this race. And it looks to me like he's got a car that can be reckoned with. Mike? That's exactly it. I put him in the position. It's like you're near the front now. These guys are going to be on pit road in anywhere from about six to seven laps to get their tires. Once they all pit on the green, that puts them back on sink. Now, what Rusty needs then, though, he can run probably to about lap 75 to 80. He needs the caution to come out before then where he don't have to be on pit road for a green flag stop. What I can't believe is Mike Wallace goes to the bottom of the racetrack, Darrell. Oh, there's still... 43 cars in this lead draft. Nobody has lost the lead draft. Everybody's hanging right in there. But let me tell you a problem for Rusty. He's running the bottom of the racetrack. He's not going to pit. All these guys are probably going to pit about the same time. He has really got to be careful not to get caught up in cars turning into the pit. In the, wall, in the wall, I think that's Jeff Purvis who bounced off the wall coming off turn number four. Caution, caution is out. The caution, caution is out. out. And I don't think the leader got it. Jeff Purvis. There's the damage to the right side of his number 51. And the field comes around to the caution, and the pit crews get ready to go to work for the first time today. The James Finch, number 51, Purvis. This is when Rusty Wallace is hollering on his radio, tell him to let me by, let me by, let me get back in the lead lap. Come on, guys, back off. The rule, though, is you need to be in touch with the leader to race him back Here to the line. Here he comes. He's, He's coming. He's trying. coming. But I don't believe Sterling and, and uh, Skinner, those guys, are going to let him beat him back to the line. If I'm Skinner's crew chief, I'm saying, look, Rusty Wallace has got a fast race car. We don't need to let him back on the lead lap. And they don't. They will take the caution flag and pin Wallace one lap behind the leader due to his unscheduled pit stop. Watch the white car right side of your screen. Here he comes. Here he is up here. It looks like he has a tire go down to me. It just looks like the car took off on him and bounced it into the fence. Looks like the right front may have gone on it, too. And, folks, they are not bad tires. We just do bad things to them. We either run low air pressure, which hurts them, or we run too much camber. And normally there's no warning when that tire goes away. Normally you hurt it when it's a new tire, but it don't show up until late in the run like on Jeff Purvis's car. Exactly. Well, this changes uh, the complexion of things. And Jeff Purvis will be towed back to the garage. Dick Bergman. Earnhardt is going to take four tires when he comes in all during speed weeks. That has been the fast way to do things. His crew here ready to go. Steve Burns. But Dick Bergen, everybody's at the ready here in the 31 pit of Mike uh, Mike Skinner. He's a little bit loose. They're going to take a little air out of the left front and add wedge. Let's go to Matt Yoakum. Both Burton brothers, the 99 of Jeff Burton and the 2204, are reporting their cars are tight. Both will take on four tires. It's going to be a wedge and air pressure adjustment for the 99 and just air pressure for the 22. Jeannie? Well, a bit of a development for the 88 car all along talking four tires and even taking two pounds out of that right rear. But guess what? Now they're just going for two tires, a change of plans, as they worked on that deal with Johnny Benson, working on a deal with the tires as well. Well, Buddy Baker can breathe a little easier. He holds the race record set in 1980. Average speed for 500 miles, 177.6 miles per hour. The first 100 miles of this race were run at 182.3. This oh, er Earnhardt, Earnhardt just ran into the back of Schrader coming into the pits. I mean, he knocked the fire out of him. 
41 cars will be on pit road. All but Rusty Wallace and Jeff Purvis. Let's go to the pits and mats. Both Tommy Wallace and Tommy Baldwin changing tires are already on the left side of the car. They made an air pressure adjustment to the right rear to help loosen up this 22 car. They're getting the second cannon. He's down and away, Steve Burns. He's in Pulverin, Sam Tubbs changing tires on the 31. But he's locked in. He has to back up to get around Kenny Schrader. Oh, tight squeeze. But he does make it. Casey Atwood also has to be pushed out of his pit stall around Mark Martin. Not a lot of room there, Larry, when you're trying to get all that service done in a hurry. That's the only thing you had about pit stops on the cops, especially this early in the race, because you've got 41 cars on there and nobody gets in their hole. It looks like Jimmy Spencer's day may be coming to an end. And Jeremy Mayfield, too fast down pit road. In the 18 car, they made some major adjustments there. I believe they took a bunch of spring rubbers out of that car. Dick Bergman. Well, there is some damage to the front end of Earnhardt's car. The crew said, don't worry about it, but that may be more psychology than anything else. The hood is pulled up just a tad. Could affect the aerodynamics of that race car. Could spoil his chances to win his second Daytona 500. Aerodynamics are so critical. These teams spend hours massaging the shapes of these cars in the wind tunnel, and then the drivers massage them out on the race track. Oh, yeah, and you know, he heard Earnhardt complaining about the car didn't run that good down the straightaway because of the headwind, and that's going to make it worse. Jimmy Spencer is pushed behind the wall. A former NASCAR modified champion may be out of this year's 500. We're under caution. You're watching the Daytona 500 on Fox. Kellogg's pit crew has a new paint job and uh, some added orange. That's all duct tape on the front of that. Surprise, Tony Tiger still has his eyes open after uh, getting involved both in the in the Rusty Wallace cut tire and now uh, being tangled up there with uh, Jeff Purvis. Yeah, he's trying to keep all those cornflakes in the box is what he's trying to do. It's so important to keep the front of the car just as clean as you can because that's the first part of the car that sees the air. If you've got it all distorted and holes in it, and Daryl, how did we ever race without what we call that duct tape, 200 mile an hour tape? I just used bailing wire myself. Here, now, let's... let's Let's show you what happened to Dale Earnhardt and Ken Schrader coming into the pits. And I believe I can explain. Here's Earnhardt right here. Now watch this car come up on the outside over here. Earnhardt wants to race everybody. And he looked over and he saw that kid coming. He said, let me show you some kid. You're not going to beat me on pit road. Whoops, Kenny Schrader's in my way. But now Dale Earnhardt wouldn't know how to drive a car if it didn't have the front end beat in on it. Oh, That's shit. exactly right. <laughs> Larry. Steve Burns. Well, Sterling Marlin's got a bit of a problem, guys. You talked about how important aerodynamics are. They've knocked a hole in the grill, and right now they're fabricating a 4 by 8 inch piece of sheet metal that they're going to place on with duct tape on the next pit stop, but that's a long time from now if this thing stays green. Well, we're coming around to get to green, and uh, there's Rusty sitting up there. He's got a chance. Now, he lines up on the inside. All the cars on the lead lap line up in the outside lane. And the cars a lap or more down line up on the inside. Today's Pep Boys Trivia. Which drivers have won the Daytona 500 from the pole more than once? I'll give you the answer in a minute. Because we're about set to go back to green. I know. But I saw the car. Andy Houston trailing Ward Burton. Mike Skinner is third. Dale Earnhardt is fourth. Jeff Gordon is fifth. Jeff Burton is sixth. Mike Wallace, seventh. Sterling Marlin, rookie Kurt Busch, and Ken Schrader are the top ten as we get set to go back to green. If Wallace can pass leader Ward Burton and stay in front of him and the caution come out, he gets a free pass around and he's back on the lead lap. Here we go. fast enough to get in front, but I don't think there's anybody going to let him stay there. He's going to have to hook up in there somewhere and uh, draft his way along and hope that a caution comes out. Rusty Wallace in front of race leader 22 Ward Burton. A little more strung out on this restart. Yeah, Rusty would love to see the caution fly, something to come off a car, uh, some of that tape or anything right now to a little light caution, get him caught back up, be back in the race. Nobody moving with the rookie, 96 Andy Houston. Everybody to the inside lane, and Houston will drift back. And you know, that's the worst feeling in the world. You say, I'm going to run high this lap. And you look back, and nobody else has decided to run high. He's got a little bit of help coming from the yellow car, Kenny Schrader, but I don't think it's near enough. Well, right now, we're going to let you enjoy some pure American NASCAR horsepower. 
let the pictures tell the story. And if you're one of the millions of NASCAR fans with surround sound, here's your chance to crank it up. lead draft and a rookie Kirk Bush going for third place there behind Sterling Marlin got pinned in traffic Earnhardt Jr. moves up to third behind Burton and Marlin and Marlin wants to lead and that dodge is potent and he wants to get that thing out front he just goes up on the outside he goes down on the inside he just takes her to the front saw some sparks fly out of the 22 car now that's a product of low air pressure from this coming out of the pits that'll go away in just a few laps right hot the car's a little low with low air pressure and exhaust pipe big bump over there in turn two will bottom out till the pressure builds up now we lost a few cars on that restart and i can explain why they were all single file when there's a single file restart and you're not doubled up it's easy to lose the draft because of anticipating the start if you don't nail it just right that lead pack will get away from you and the first thing you know you're out of the draft Two of the cars that lost out, Bobby Labonte, the defending Winston Cup champ, and the defending race champion, Dale Jarrett. Jimmy Spencer is in the garage area. They're changing the rear end on his Travis Carter number 26. Boy, if you're Robin Pemberton, Rusty Wallace, crew chief, you're just sitting there begging, please, can't there be a caution? We don't want nobody to have a problem, but can't there be a piece of debris on a racetrack or something? We need a caution flag. And you know who's calling in the most? Rusty, Rusty Wallace. Wallace. Right. <laughs> I see something in turn three. There's a piece of something in three. Wallace, number two, just ahead of the race leader, Ward Burton in 22. And, of course, Gary Nelson's over there saying, I can't hear you. That's the NASCAR Winston Cup director, Dick Bergeron. Ricky Rudd, who was one of the pre-race favorites, has just called his crew and said he has a vibration in his car. Vibrations do not go away. They are often the result of a loose wheel or some sort of a fairly significant problem. So far, he has hung out there on the racetrack. And it's a terrible place to be as a driver. You don't want to make a pit stop and find out there was nothing wrong. Maybe it's a tire that's just a little out of balance. Or maybe it's just something is happening to the car but it has no big effect on the car so if you pitch you're out of the daytona 500 and you can't afford to do that daryl i've been watching the 88 car since the restart they have dropped almost two and a half seconds behind but in two laps they've closed it back down a full second so they're coming yeah that that group back there we know that the 18 the 88 those cars in the back back there the 12s back there well, they're, they're fast race cars, and uh, I think if we saw Dale Jarrett, if you think about practice, he did a lot of running all by himself for this very reason. Meanwhile, Dale Earnhardt, who restarted fourth, has fallen to 20th. So Ward Burton, the leader. Mike Wallace, presently in second. Mark Martin has fought his way up to third. Dale Earnhardt Jr. is fourth. And Ron Hornaday, the rookie in that green number 14, up for fifth, and rookie Casey Atwood battling him. And he, he's going to the front without a lot of help there. There, Kenny Schrader in the yellow car does jump in behind him, but he was going to the front on the bottom there with no help at all, pushing from behind. Dodges, uh, when they get them right, looks like they can really run. This new aerodynamics package that NASCAR has instituted has created such parity that right now, half of the drivers in the top 10 positions have never won a Winston Cup race. 
They'll turn the screws a little tighter as the Daytona 500 rolls on on Fox. Welcome back to Daytona, where Ward Burton continues to lead, Dale Earnhardt Jr., and now Dave Blaney. So, who are the drivers who've won the Daytona 500 from the pole more than once? Bill Elliott. That's, Kale, my, that's my pick, too. And Cale Yarborough. Cale Yarborough, yeah. Our Pep Boys trivia. You're riding with Bill Elliott, pole sitter for the 500. And right now runs back in 37. Now at Fox, we'd like to bring a lot of innovations to NASCAR, including a way to help you at home identify the cars more easily than before. It's not quite ready, but we'll give you a small taste of what we're doing. There you see that pointer aiming at Ward Burton, help you find him if we're talking about where he is in relation to rookie Casey Atwood. Fox tracks will point it out, point out their speed as of the moment. It's an innovation that uh, we'll hope to Get all the bugs ironed out and roll it out for real in a couple of weeks. But just another way those of us at Fox are trying to help those of you at home enjoy NASCAR racing. I saw why Ward Burton was better than that race car the other way it was highlighted. He's running faster miles per hour through the corner. About the same on the straightaway, but faster through the corner, Darrell. I, I was uh, surprised nobody picked Ward to win the Daytona 500. I know he is capable. I know that car's fast enough. It's just a matter of the strategy will work out for him or not. You know, a car we hadn't talked about is that blue and silver number six, Mark Martin, started 22nd. We watched him yesterday in practice. He smiled for the first time in 10 days. He had his old car <laughs> driving good, his old motor's running good, and he was the only one of four Roush cars that did not change their race engine this morning. Yeah, I believe as time goes by, we'll see parity come to the top. Uh, I think what you'll find is all these makes are pretty equal in the race. Dodge racing at Daytona for the first time since 1983. And they've spent a lot of time up front today. Sterling Marlin thus far has led 24 laps. Ward Burton will lead his 15th lap of the day, also in a Dodge right now. And that's his teammate, the 93 car, Dave Blaney, there behind Dale Earnhardt Jr., both driving for Bill Davis Racing. One thing I've noticed about the Dodge, about the Sterlings and the 22 car both, is when they want to get in front, they seem to have the stuff to get it done. Everybody else struggles a little bit. They seem to be able to pull out and go to the front. Last Dodge to lead a lap in Winston Cup Racing, Buddy Arrington, Atlanta, March 1983, until today. I was there. I was at that race. I think I won it. Jimmy Spencer returns to the race after changing the rear end. And he's Travis Carter, 26. You know, there's a place, there's a time in every race when uh, you just kind of get in this mode we're in right now as a driver and as a crew. All right, let's get some laps on the board. Let's uh, let's get let's ride along here a little bit, and let's see what's going to happen to these cars. We didn't make it quite to the green flag stop while ago, so uh, let's run these laps here and see what's going to happen. Those two rookies, Casey Atwood in 19, and uh, Andy Houston in the yellow red 96, they've worked together a lot today, and Andy Houston, his car was another one. Put a new race motor in this morning. Got that Robert Yates power there. Yeah, and Leffler's right in there, too, in the 01 car. He's just kind of hanging in there. Hadn't made a lot of noise, but uh, he's right up in the middle of them. Darrell, a lot of the veteran drivers may not trust the rookie. Do they have to, are they then left to work with each other? Well, you got to earn trust. That's really what it's all about. And uh, those guys know that. These rookies do. These are smart kids that are coming in our sport today. And they don't make a lot of mistakes, and the veterans pay attention to that. You do have to earn that trust. Mike Skinner, when I went to work for him, he said, Larry, I don't understand it. Nobody will run with me. I said, Darrell, drivers aren't too smart. When they go off in the corner and the caution lights are on and you're in the fence, that means they can't run with you. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> uh, well, they're not predictable. They, they don't have the experience, so you don't really know what their G2 is. You don't know what to expect out of them. And so you watch them. The best thing to have to a rookie in this race, when it's over with, you never knew he was in the field. Ron Hornaday, one of those rookies, number 14, in eighth place, Kurt Busch. Ian Hornaday out of the truck series. Jason Leffler spent last year in the Busch series, and before that ran USAC Midgets. Casey Atwood last year in the Busch series. Before that, he ran late models at Nashville. Well, the truck series is producing some pretty good races. Andy Houston and uh, Hornaday's in there. 
Greg Biffle was in the Bush car yesterday. So they're, they're, these guys are producing some, the trucks are producing some good drivers. Now this is Mike Skinner was up there leading before the caution. After the caution, remember they talked about his car being a little loose, going to make some adjustments. Sometimes you can over adjust. If he was leading and he was telling me I'm a little loose, I might say, let's try another set of tires and see if that changes. He's all the way back to 27th position now and losing more. You know what? Every time I put wedge in the car here, added wedge to the car to try to tighten it up, it made it looser. Steve? Well, yeah, when the 31 came in, he complained of being loose. They were going to add wedge, take some air out of the left front. But he has not said a word to the team since he's gone back out there. All we hear is a spotter telling him about the traffic around him. But Mike Skinner has not said a word, Dick Bergeron. Bill Elliott, who started on the pole, is all the way back to 38th right now, way at the tail end. I just spoke with his crew chief, Mike Ford, asked him what's wrong. He said, well, he's just kind of laying back. And I said, well, is there anything more in that? Ford looked at me and said, I sure hope so. There's last year's winner, Dale Jarrett, this year's pole sitter and three-time winner, Bill Elliott. They're all hanging out back. Yeah, and, and I think what they're thinking is they're just going to drag everybody back to their level. If they're not going to run up front, I think everybody's just going to back up to them. I don't know. Tell that to Ward Burton and Dale Earnhardt <laughs> Jr. as they bring this group around. 70 laps complete this time. 175 miles. And Ward Burton leads the Daytona 500 on Fox. I've always related, but a crew chief is like a head football coach. You've been formulating your game plan all week. You come here with your game plan, but that old race car, it can throw you a curve early. You've got to adjust your game plan. And Dale Earnhardt, they've been adjusting their plan. He's done worked his way, headed back to the front in that black three. Yep, Earnhardt's back, and he's hunting the lead. Not a good place to be. Sucker hole. Uh, he's going to have to get back on one of those lines pretty quick. Yeah, but he's getting some help. But you notice how he's dancing around in there? He don't like that. That's not something he likes. He's getting a good old push there from that green 14 now, Ron Hornaday. Yeah, that's his uh, boss, his ex-boss up there, you know. I'm sure Hornaday says, hey, remember me? Used to drive in the Truck and Bush Series for Earnhardt, now works for A.J. Foyt. But he just left his ex-employee hung out to drive. Yeah, middle well, he knows he can't stay in that middle very long. That is not the place to be. He'll be in the back in a hurry. Boy, Hornaday just barely got in front of Kurt Busch in the 97 car. Kurt's going to say, hey, you're going to get in there. You're going to take my push with you. <laughs> right with him, John Andretti. He's moved up to challenge that top 10, and Petty's 43. Another rookie caught in the middle. There's the red nose of Andy Houston's car. And here comes Earnhardt down the inside. Under Marlin, three wide through the trioval. And he almost took the nose off Marlin's car coming back up. I believe Schrader led that route the lap. He did. Good man, Schrader. That outside line is on the move right now. They got a good run through the trial. Got his, uh, another lead change, our boys. Yep, Ken Schrader becomes the eighth different leader of this race. That car has been strong all week. They hadn't made very many adjustments to that race car. They've just kind of fine-tuned on it. It's run good and it's drove good all week. Biggest movers of this race, Ron Hornaday, 33 spots ahead of where he started. John Andretti's picked up 23 spots. Mark Martin, Kirk Busch, Brett Bodine, who started last. Jeff Hammond. Mike Joy, Mike Joy, I've been watching the win from down here in my vantage point. And I'm telling you, it's really starting to kick up. And also notice that all overall lap speeds are off considerably from practice as well as from the 125s. And I believe this win's got something to do with it. A stiff breeze across turn one. Yeah, and I believe those Dodges may have anticipated that because they seem to have a little bit ge a better gear selection to me. They can really stretch out down that back straightaway. Sterling and the 22 car both. Four top contenders are way out back. Bobby Labonte, his teammate Tony Stewart, as Mark Martin goes to the lead. Well, that's that old dog he said wouldn't hunt. He's been complaining about that car for 11 days. We talked about it earlier. He's done something that it takes to get the victory lane here at Daytona. You don't always have to be the fastest car, but you got to have the best handling car. And I know Mark knows more about cars than most of the guys out there. Here we go. That's another one. I'm keeping count right there. 16 lead changes now among nine different drivers. 
It's funny how they ride along. Nobody wants to leave, and they just kind of, somebody stays there, and all of a sudden, here they come and start racing. Darrell, that's the first green flag lap that a Ford has led today. Last year, they dominated this race. Well, it was, uh, you know, politically, they've been uh, complaining about their cars, and uh, who knows? Still early. Ron Hornaday. Now, this would be big if Hornaday could lead a lap. He is a rookie. It's A.J. Foyt's car. Sterling's back there. Earnhardt underneath him. Hornaday takes him downstairs. Thinks better of it. Good thinking. Schrader leads this lap. Wow. Sure, I'm glad they paid these aprons. You know, they got them big and wide. So, good thing. Ward Burton down to the bottom. You see Hornaday, the green car, lost a bit of momentum there and his breath, and it cost him position. He had to back off the throttle, and with that restrictor plate on that carburetor, you have to back off. It takes a little while to get back up to speed. I don't know if Earnhardt wants to mess with that bulldog. Well, I don't think he does, but I think he also wants to kind of hide himself back in there for a few minutes, so maybe Earnhardt won't remember who it was, because <laughs> Earnhardt will get you for doing stuff like that. Ron Hornaday drove for Earnhardt last season, and Earnhardt let him go when he decided to run three Winston Cup teams instead of two Cup teams and a Bush team. This is coming in the trial. There you see they're just a beating and a banging on each other, trying to break each other's momentum. It didn't take but one little lick, though, for Hornaday to get up out of the way. <laughs> he didn't want any part of that. Would you? No, I've had my taste of that fender, and uh, every time I ever felt that, the uh, next thing I heard was... Oh, jeez. <laughs> Lead change again. Here comes Mark Martin on Schrader. Kurt Busch is right there with him, Jeff. Mike, I'd like to add the young man you walked watching back in that 97 car, Kurt Busch, driving for Jack Rouse. I worked with him about seven races last year, and I got news for you. The kid is probably one of the sharpest drivers I've ever worked with, including you, Daryl. I'm telling you right now, the kid <laughs> has got some talent. He's had a really tough well, 11 days here at uh, Daytona. But Jack and the rest of the crew have worked very hard on 97 car, and they've got him up there in the front right now. It looks like he's doing a very good job. Mike? Jack, Jack Roush told me three times this week, I said, Jack, what's wrong? Jack, what's wrong? And he said, DW, we're here for 11 days. You don't use all your stuff up till it's time. Uh -huh. Steve Burns. Well, Kenny Schrader's having a great day here today. They were one of the teams that changed motors, but they made their change before happy hour yesterday, the final practice before this race. And Schrader said it was the best motor and best combination that he had had since he'd been here at Speed Weeks, which seemed like it started about a month ago. Well, Schrader has not won since Dover, Delaware in 1991. That was 303 races ago. Well, that's a Hendrick motor in there, Randy Dorton and the guys. And... Uh... They've always make good power. Jeff Gordon, the 25 car, and they do. Terry Labonte, they all make good power. First 500 that Ken Schrader has led since 1996. Nine different leaders. Trader's car. See, that's that's where, remember, Earnhardt got into him on pit road. And, Darrell, what I've seen with these race cars, sometimes that rear bumper being a little higher, that thing will go through there because that rear bumper's not hanging down, catching that air. Bobby Allison dropped, he and Gary Nelson dropped their bumper off here in 1981 or two off of their Buick and picked up a ton of speed, dropped it off in the race. They had it rigged up to fall off. Now, Gary said that wasn't on purpose. That it got knocked off. Exactly. Ken... I tell you, somebody ought to be standing up in the pit, jumping up and down, if he could, is A.J. Foyt. I mean, they put he put Ron Hornaday in that car for this year. Ron's 42 years old. He's a rookie. A lot of people question that call, but I want you to look where that cat is and how he got Whoa! It. Did you see Earnhardt bounce off Kurt Busch Boy, there on turn four? Yeah, and Earnhardt stuck his hand out the window, too, as they come off turn four. Oh, boy, that's the lamb and the lion going at it right there. Earnhardt, just think how well he can drive with one hand. If he'd put them both on the steering wheel, he'd really be tough. He shakes his fist. He gives more direction than anybody out there. Mike Skinner in the blue 31, it wasn't but about 10 or 12 laps ago. They said he wasn't saying nothing. He was in 27. He's done worked his way up to about seven. I've got to see this again. Well, Earnhardt's trying to make it three wide. Boom. Right here, you'll see his hand off. Replay cut it off there. 
Wait a minute, you might see it this time. Watch this. Bam. That's just a little light tap. There's that hand waving. <laughs> There it is. Kurt, you're number one. You are. <laughs> Teach him rookie something. Terry Labonte is on pit road. This is an unexpected stop. We've only gone about 30 feet. Driving if they're going to take two tires. I know you don't. <laughs> I don't want to be the crew chief if he tells me he's going to take two. <laughs> Not like my Earn car. <laughs> be like Earnhardt said. I ain't leaving till you give me four. That's right. <laughs> Michael Waltrip, 15. Dale Earnhardt Jr. in the eight. Those are also team cars. Dale Earnhardt owns those and Steve Park's team. Well, I'm glad I'm glad Michael finally got up there where we could talk about him a little bit because he has uh, been kind of hanging back in the back. But as we run down to the end of this run, get ready for pit stops, his car looks like it's really working pretty good for him right now. Michael loves Daytona and he, he always runs up front here. Michael Waltrip up to ninth spot. Daryl's younger brother, Jeff. Daryl, I just wanted to let you know that when I was talking to Michael early this morning, he told me he was going to take a little bit from you and a little bit from Earnhardt and try to mix them together to make the day's run. He said, I'm going to lay back for a little bit, get a feel for my car, tune on at the first stop, and I'm going to the front. Uh, he's very confident. Earnhardt to pit. And Sterling with him. Hornaday with him as well. Here comes Hornaday. Halfway this time by. Five cars are on the pit lane under green. Jason Leffler is coming in with them. And Stoic State C. Compton. Jeannie? Well, Ron Hornaday will indeed take four tires. And the impressive part here, how'd you like to be doing all this stuff? The splash of fuel, clean the windshield with A.J. Foyt looking on. Dick? Bernard will take four tires. Coroner Richard Childress is the guy who has made the call. That is all the adjustments you're going to see on the hood. One of the crew members just nailed it to Steve. Sterling Marlin's going to get four tires, Dick. They also took a tearaway off the windshield. They talked about making a wedge adjustment. 14 is out. Three's out. Sterling Marlin's out as well. It'll take them a while to get drafted back up, and the field comes off turn number four. And here is another group coming onto pit road, led by Mike Skinner. Ken Schrader is coming in. There are this time more than a dozen cars in the pit lane. Kurt Busch, Jeff Gordon, Steve Park, Ricky Rudd, all making this pit stop. Russ, uh, Kenny Wallace, Mike Wallace, both Bill Elliott and his teammate Casey Atwood, Dave Blaney, John Andretti, Kyle Petty, and Robbie Gordon are all in the pit. Steve? And Mike, Mike Skinner's in. They take a tear off the windshield as well. Four tires. They do make a chassis adjustment to the right rear corner of the number 31. Left side tires now going on. Looks like a good stop for Mike Skinner. Let's go to Dick Bergeron. Bill Elliott, the pole sitter down on pit road. This crew is basically the same crew he worked with last year before he changed brands. He's out of here after a four-tire change. Wow, this will jumble up the field. Ward Burton continues to lead. Jeff Burton, his brother, one's in a Dodge, one's in a Ford, and here they come to pit road. The Burton brothers lead this charge in. Dale Earnhardt Jr., Jerry Nadeau, Mark Martin, Ricky Craven, Andy Houston, Jeremy Mayfield, Matt Kenseth, and eight more in the pits. Matt? The 22 is in his pit. He said his car was just a tick tight. His car was much better when out in front. The 99s also in a four-tire four stop for both cars. They're going to adjust the 22 slightly with air pressure and air pressure adjustment. And the 99, he's down and away. He beats the 22 off pit road. Bobby Labonte is also in. So is Dale Jarrett. Dick? Dale Earnhardt Jr. on pit road. They let the rear tire get away from them. It's lying out there on pit road. There, a crew member finally goes and grabs it. Well, it almost rolled across pit row. They were lucky to grab that thing before it fell over. Green flag stops continue. Rusty Wallace comes in and brings Michael Waltrip with him. Buckshot Jones, Casey Atwood is coming back in for a second stop. And Jimmy Spencer. And I'm not sure if that is Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s tire that NASCAR will not bring him back in for a penalty because if your tire rolls across center line of pit road, it is a penalty. That was some of the wildest pit stop action I believe I've ever seen. Cars were everywhere, and, uh, and we don't get to make that many green flag stops, Larry. Most times we'll drag them under cars. Well, I talked about it earlier. What I like is that first group that pitted it. With the five cars on pit road, it was total melee the next two times that cars was on pit road. Trouble, though, for Casey Atwood. He came back in to top off the tank and I think take a piece of tape from the grill. Going to be a penalty on Ron Hornaday for speeding down pit road. He'll come in to serve that penalty now. 
I always ask my crew chief, Larry, will you work with the team around us so there's nobody in my way when I come in, so I can get in and out? Hornaday stalled the engine on the exit while ago, and he, it frustrated him so much that he, he sped down pit road. Robert Presley out as well, and there's four-time Indy winner and 72 Daytona 500 winner A.J. Foyt, who owns Hornaday's car. What happens to a driver, guys, is when he's been out there driving, 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 and he's got his right foot pe pegged, when he comes in, the clutch foot don't work so well. Jeff Gordon assumes the lead. Earnhardt chomping on his back bumper, cuts to the inside. And Skinner will lead this lap from Earnhardt by about a foot. That's the way it's been all day. Well, that's a car we hadn't talked about much. The yellow car there behind Earnhardt, that's, he drives for Dale Earnhardt. That's Steve Park in the yellow number one. He's finally made his way up to the front. Well, Kyle Petty is back on pit road. Made a stop a couple of laps ago. Now comes back in for a penalty stop, and now Kyle is away. You know what? The, you can usually tell who have the best pit crews when you have green flag pit stops. You see how it broke up that front pack into about a group of 15 or so, and then another group of 15 or so. Mike Skinner came in first, came out third. Casey Atwood had to come back in to retighten lug nuts. That's put him back into 13th place. And we're told the penalty on Kyle Petty was because it is his tire that is sitting out in the infield grass. It got away from the crewmen on his scheduled pit stop. And you know what? They're going to leave it there, I think. I don't want anybody to know whose it is. We're just past halfway in the Great American Race. 105 laps complete in the Daytona 500. Welcome back to the Daytona 500 on Fox. Jeff Gordon has taken the lead for the first time today. He's brought Ricky Rudd with him. Dale Earnhardt sits in third. Tonight on Fox, Futurama at 7, King of the Hill at 7.30, and Sideshow Bob control Bart's mind. Kelsey Grammer gets on The Simpsons, then Malcolm in the Middle, and The X-Files. It's all new on Fox, starting at 7, 6 Central tonight. Steve Park, Dale Earnhardt, and the third of those Chevrolets is the 31 of Mike Skinner chasing Jeff Gordon. It's a Chevy front four. Now at Fox, we're working on a number of new innovations for our NASCAR coverage, including a way for you to identify the cars more easily at home. Here's a little demonstration of Fox tracks. It'll help us pinpoint drivers for you in the field. Rusty Wallace back there, trying to work his way back up on the lead lap will pinpoint him. Every car has a GPS receiver. The Sport Vision folks, they have telemetry all around the racetrack to keep you pinned into those cars. There's Mike Skinner working up the outside and showing his speeds. Earnhardt versus Skinner and Wallace. At this point, Skinner just a little bit faster coming off that corner than is Earnhardt. This is just a demonstration, folks. If this didn't work too well, we can call it an experiment. But in coming weeks, we're going to roll out Fox tracks on our NASCAR coverage. Don't need Fox tracks to show you where Jeff Gordon is. Remember, after seizing an engine in yesterday's final practice, they installed a new lump under the hood, and he is leading this race. Rusty's car will really go down that back, but you got to realize he's back in the pack here and he's getting help from all those cars that are in front of him. But you'll watch his speed fall off when he gets to the corner because he can't maintain that because of traffic. And that's the dilemma these drivers have. Get a run, you got nowhere to go. Right now, they got the black uh, car of Ricky Rudd, the 28 car hung in the middle. Remember, Ricky had that vibration earlier, finally got the pit road on that green flag stop, and hopefully that vibration's gone away. Well, I tell you, you've got to protect that inside line. If you let a car get under you, that's what happens. Coming off the four and going down into one, that inside line is really, really the way to go. A minute ago, Rudd was up to second. Suddenly, he's been kicked back to 10. Matt Yoko. Mike, when Steve Park was a rookie in the Bush Series, he went to the Dale Earnhardt School of Drafting. Earnhardt, in fact, one night sat down with Steve with a napkin 
and drew a diagram of Daytona and how he needed to draft around this track with other cars. He's obviously learned his lesson well. Last night in Happy Hour, the crew did make some changes, though. They went to a lower gear and a different shock package. Right now, the car is very comfortable, and he was very content riding behind the three. The Long Island second-generation NASCAR modified driver started 25th. He's up to third. Look at Stern Martin in the silver car blow. The seven car Mike Wallace making it three wide going into turn one. Sterling's done that a lot today. Yes, he has. And the reason that's happening right there particularly, the wind is pushing those cars down, and down into turn one really, really fast. From Ricky Rudd looking back. 182 miles an hour, 6,900 RPM. Mark Martin goes by on the outside or pulls up on the outside. Right now, the tire's pretty fresh. See that throttle? He just flipped it just a little bit to get in the corner. Sometimes you got to back off just a little bit to keep from hitting the car in front of you, though, Darrell. That's mainly what's happening. If we had a brake pedal on here, you'd probably see he's riding that brake a little bit, too. Telemetry also showing where he is on the track, going now through the tri-oval. 18-degree banking here at start-finish. This is where he's at on the racetrack. Ward Burton right behind him. Boys, there's some slicing and dicing going on now. Darrell, I don't think I've ever seen a Daytona 500 with this many cars holding up in that lead pack. And that second group that came out of the pit a little late has caught back up. So, like drivers have told me all along, you can't get out of the draft. Often, green flag pit stops will spread the field all out. Here, they're spread across the racetrack instead of the length of it. Four wide for a moment. Guys, I was talking the difference between that first pack that came out of the pit and the group that came out later. There was an eight-second spread. Now you can see eight seconds has gotten right back down to about a two-and-a-half-second spread between the guys leading it and the tail end of that pack. Jeff Gordon was leading a moment ago. Let's go to his pit, Dick. We've had a lot of conversation about the engine in your race car. Is it okay, Robbie? Yeah, the engine's great. I tell you, you know, it's just right now you got to stay out of trouble trying to get to that last lap and figure out what we can do there. To later. Who are you working with today? <laughs> Jeff Gordon. I tell you what, it's hard out there. You know, you get with somebody and you get messed up, you get shuffled to the back. You just got to do all you can right now. All right, good luck, bud. Sterling Marlin just shot back around Earnhardt going down the back. And he's going to be our leader when they get back here, I think. 26 lead changes so far among 11 drivers. 15 different leaders is the race record. Two cars that consistently have been up there and been able to get in the lead has been Sterling's car and Ward Burton's car. They seem to be able to get in the lead if they can get the right line working with them. There goes Gordon getting that run over turn one and two, getting the help from the seven car, Mike Wallace, but I don't know. He drifted up awfully high up there coming off turn two. I think Gordo's car is pushing up on him a little bit, probably more than he'd like for it to, and it's opening up a lane underneath of him that he would like to not have happen. Three wide once again, heading for turn three. Jerry Nadeau, 25, caught in the middle with Ricky Rudd, Jeremy Mayfield, and Bobby Hamilton, and there's Steve Park, the yellow car in the middle, number one. Jeannie? came through here on the radio and said, sorry about that pit stop. I, I overran things a little bit, but I'll make it up to you. And he is making it up to you, isn't he? Yeah, you know, first pit stop, we kind of slid through the pits. And, uh, you know, everybody kept a real calm head, and we got him pushed back and had a decent stop. But, uh, you know, obviously we had to start in the back. And then you know, now we've had the green flag stop. We had a really good stop and got him up in front. So everything's real good right now. All right, we'll leave you to the business of uh, wheeling and dealing up here. Thanks for the time. Thanks. Paul Andrews, championship crew chief. 92 with Alan Kowicki. 116 laps complete. Jeff Gordon out front. Mike Wallace, one of three brothers in this race, up to second. Mike Skinner and Ken Schrader fight for third. Sterling Marlin right up there. You're watching the Daytona 500 on the log jam. He'll have to get through to get to victory lane. 80 laps to go. One more pit stop. Tick, 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 tick. Tony Stewart has come up toward that front pack for the first time today. Winner of the Budweiser shootout last Sunday. Jeremy Mayfield in the 12th car, the blue and white car there. He has spent the entire 120 laps, I think, in the middle of this pack. Not on the outside, not on the inside, but in the middle. You know why? He hadn't been fast enough to go anywhere. He just kind of rides in the middle. He, he's, he's 
struggled with that car. As bad as I hate to say it all week long, because he's a buddy of mine, but he has struggled with that car all week long. 11 leaders today. Four more will tie the record. Stewart's number 20 runs alongside the 99 of Burton. And here is Earnhardt filling up Tony Stewart's mirror. You can hear the change in the RPM of uh, Earnhardt's engine off the two over there. That's, that's the car just jumping around on him. Bad bump over there in turns. It really is. And down low. Down low, and then with the wind blowing, that's what gets him in trouble off the two over there. Passing Kenny Wallace, 27. Michael Walker, 15. Moving up on Mark Martin's number six. Presley slide up right there again. That's the reason three wide will not work. And one car dives to the apron after getting shuffled out of line. That was Jerry Nadu. Nadu's got wheel marks all down the right side of his car. I feel the I feel that old clock ticking, boys, and it's getting louder. That's Robert Presley in the yellow 77. He is a lap down, but he keeps fighting up there with the leaders. Hopefully, caution come out. He can make his lap back up. Well, he and Hornaday went a lap down. Hornaday's able to hang at the front of this pack pretty good. Robert can, and uh, it's causing a little bit of a problem back in there. Meanwhile, Ward Burton went from ninth to second in one lap. Some of these guys, I believe, are falling back and kind of seeing how long it takes them to get back to the front. The guys that I believe are factors, the guys that can win this race, they fall back to 15th or 20th, and then they try to work their way back up through there to see how long it's going to take them. See Jeremy Mayfield, the 12th car. He may not be running good, but he's worked his way up to fifth position. Look at him, three by three by three by three. Folks, and this is at 123 laps into this race, and it's just like we just started. This is a clogged drain right here. Pour something down it to sort this out. <laughs> at 190 miles an hour. Steve Burns. With Royce McGee, rookie crew chief for Mike Skinner. Royce, how can you look so calm with the action we're seeing on that racetrack? I'm pretty excited inside. Just, just got to uh, keep your patience because if I get excited, it excites Mike a little bit. He's the one out there that got business to do. And with this low Chevrolet, we're just trying to do the best we can today. All right, let's go to Matt Yoakum. Good. The 22 car is gone from the front to the back to the front to the back. Tommy Baldwin Jr. watching his car. Tommy, does your car work better out front or behind someone? Uh, actually, it's been pretty good both ways. You know, we're about four laps ago, we fell back to 20th. Uh, we've got a bad group of cars that made the car push a little bit. But, uh, you know, I think we're pretty good either way. We're going to make a little bit more adjustments on this last stop in about 50 laps. But uh, we'll be all right. We've got a lot of wind coming coming down the back stretch into turn two, and it's making the car push real bad, especially when there's a lot of cars around. So uh, we're trying to keep them calm, let them know it's the wind, it's not the car, and uh, keep them focused. Pulling a number of crew chiefs after happy hours. So if you had one car that you wanted to work with the entire race, 80% said the 22. Interesting. Very calm driver. Ward Burton has just surrendered the lead. Dale Earnhardt Jr. Calm driver with a very aggressive young crew chief, Tommy Baldwin. Earnhardt Jr. up front. But for how long? Here comes Marlin on the inside. Getting a push from Jeremy Mayfield in the blue number 12. They're down on the inside. They're going to take over first and second. This reminds me of when I play golf. I'm using every bit of the course, and that's what these <laughs> guys are doing, boys. I'm, they are everywhere. And your lead goes by in the blink of an eye. It wasn't very long ago until Jeremy Mayfield had us. Uh, they held him up for a speeding on pit road. And uh, here he is in second place. And my apologies to him for saying he wasn't running very good. Because <laughs> he hadn't shown any speed all week long. He struggled with the car, but it's coming on now. Sterling Marlin pulls them around. Daytona International Speedway. He's now led 30 laps today. 126 complete, 74 to go in the Daytona 500 for the lead in the Daytona 500. With us today, the Budweiser.com airship reminding race fans Budweiser is NASCAR's official beer. Ward Burton pulls them around. Mike Skinner, Sterling Marlin, Jeremy Mayfield, Jeff Gordon right there, and Earnhardt Jr. And now here's Matt Kenseth by himself. I think something happened to the car, like he maybe lost his cylinder or something because he dropped way off the pace. Steve? 
actually what happened was Matt Ketseth broke a right front shock on that number 17. The crew is ready. It looks like they're going to have to bring him in. That makes it kind of ill to drive, but uh, believe it or not, that's the best one to break. See how it's bouncing up and down. You can see the front end there as it goes along. And what they would hope is a caution will come. They can get to pit road, and you can probably change a right front shock here under caution without losing a lap. Well, these shocks are so aggressive that more than likely he broke the mount. More than likely he pulled the mount right up out of the roll bar. And here goes Gordy down on the inside looking for the lead. Jeff Gordon taking Ricky Rudd with him. Remember, Rudd is trying to win his first 500 in 24 starts. How about the orange number 20 car there? He had been in the picture, pulls right up on the back of Mike Skinner in turn four, and here he is battling to get in that top 10 and get up there with the leader. Robbie Gordon comes underneath him, though. Look at Gordon on the left. He's been very aggressive in his march to the front. Got into the back of Ricky Craven a bit ago. Squirrel Craven up. Keeps coming toward the front. Robbie Gordon riding for Morgan McClure. They've been to victory lane in the 500. That yellow number four. I got to believe if I'm driving that three car, I fell back to 20th place. I said, Richard, tell me how many laps it takes me to get back to the front. Uh -huh. So when the thing comes down like he did at Talladega, you can make those big passes. Robbie Gordon waving off there. A big wave in the window, that number four, back at Tony Stewart. I think it's because he crowded him a little bit when he made that pass. Well, he has been aggressive. Look at right up here and get into Ricky Craven. Oh, boy, he got him bad loose. Throw him down on the apron. Gordon spent a season in NASCAR with Felix Sabatis, then started his own team. Now Larry McClure has put the IndyCar veteran behind the wheel of his number four. He is a very talented young man. He can drive a race car if they can keep the bit in his mouth. Keep him under control. David F. should be pretty good at that. He's worked with some hot heads before. Tony Stewart moving to the inside, bringing Joe Nemechek with him in the 33 car, and they're going to make the pass going into turn three. I was referring to myself, by the way. But you know, Daryl, it's a whole lot easier to pull that rope than push it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mikey Walter Whoa. getting squeezed in the middle. Man. And Skinner right down to the apron to try to work past Kurt Busch. 31 is Skinner. Bush got kicked way up high. And Skinner pulls right up on Earnhardt's bumper. There's such a difference in the way these cars are handling right now. Some can run wide open, some can't. And you're getting that big draft pulling up. The closing rate is really fast when you're in the back back there. Somebody's going to run over somebody here before long. Darrell turns one and two are in shade, three and four in heavy sun. Big difference? Well, a lot of difference. The thing about the one and two is we got the wind blowing about 20 miles an hour right down that toward that corner we got a headwind up the back so it bundles them up boxes them up into three then they all get strung out and they make a big run down toward turn one chesapeake virginia's ricky rudd started 30th laid in the back of the pack for a while and now he's up there in third or is it fourth as they come across too wide now you can see looking out that windshield i'd be telling my crew on that stop i need a tear off pulled away i need to take a layer of that pair tear off so i can see the sun's starting to bother me so here in Daytona, at these high speeds, because we're near the beach, the windshield will actually get sandblasted. You can't clean it, but again, that's the reason we run the tear-offs, pull off, and it's like a new windshield. A tear-off, folks, is a piece of Lexan, a, a thin piece of Lexan that glues to the windshield, and you can pull it off like a tear-off on, uh, on a helmet, like a dirt track driver would use. Matt Kenson, they're going to go under the hood, Steve. Mike, and they're looking at that right front shock that we said was broken a while ago. Hood up, this is going to cost incredible time for Matt Kenseth and the bid for this 43rd annual Daytona 500. There's not a whole lot they can do right now. They're going to jack up the right side of the car to see if they can get at it, but again, he's dead in the water right now. As is Dave Blaney coming down pit road very slowly. One of those Bill Davis Dodges, Ward Burton, is the other. He's headed toward the pits, so he thinks that maybe they can fix it. Burton, his teammate, leads. The South Boston, Virginia driver, one of three brothers, all did a little bit of racing, and now Ward and Jeff compete in Winston Cup. Sterling Mullen trying to get his little group together there on the house side in the 40 car. Matt, what's wrong with Dave Blaney? 
He just went down pit road, Mike. His car was silent. Dave came on the radio and said, I think it might have broken the crank. It might have broken a crank. I'm not sure. It sounds like something deep in the motor. Well, that would be the first failure among the 10 Dodges in this race. Yeah, but they've had the least amount of problems to anybody down here the whole 10 days we've been here. So uh, that's uh, unfortunate for them, and I don't think it's a sign of things to come. That's probably one of those one-off deals. His teammate, Ward Burton, leaves. The soft-spoken outdoorsman from South Boston, Virginia, now loses the lead to Sterling Marlin on the high side, second-generation driver whose dad won a 125-mile qualifier here nearly three decades ago. Well, and Burton comes back. We've seen everybody being relatively patient and, and, and willing to work together, but we're running out of time. One more pit stop to go. 137 laps in, 63 to go. Ward Burton leads Jeff Gordon, Sterling Marlin, and Ricky Rudd in the Daytona 500. And uh, Mike Wallace was in two laps ago. Ward Burton, Sterling Marlin, two Dodges and a Ford. Kurt Busch, the rookie from out of the NASCAR Truck Series. Likes to go to Major League ballparks on his off weekends. He's not going to have any of those this summer. He's racing Winston Cup. Boy, look at Ward Burton get to run up the middle right there, right beside Sterling Marlin coming off turn four right there. Mike, Wall Mike Wallace calls that. He's uh, going a lap down right there, and it just gave him a little suck on the inside there. One thing I think everybody needs to pay attention to, a lot of guys that run in the back earlier are flexing their muscle and trying to get to the front. Reason being, this may be their last pit stop coming up, so they need to know what they need to do to their cars to get them just right for the run to the finish. Mike? Thanks, Jeff. They're going to lap past Terry Labonte, who also just made a green flag pit stop as things cycle through. Sterling Marlin has gone back up front. He's led 31 laps today. Ward Burton has led the most, 44. Mike, question. Years I've watched this race, here we are, 140 laps, 350 miles into this event, and they're running record speeds out here, but I have never seen them run this fast and double wide this long. It's a remarkable race and so beautifully driven. It's all due, Ken, to the new aerodynamics package that NASCAR instituted last fall at Talladega. The cars push a bigger hole in the wind, so following cars find it easier to draft up and have a chance to pass. But I don't think anyone expected a race like this. And I know that, that it's easy to say it's the aero package, it's the aero package, but it takes all your focus, all your concentration, and all that hard working out you did all winter long to sit in there and sit on that hot stove and sweat ice water. Speaking of sweat, rookie Kurt Busch getting a little lesson from Dale Earnhardt Jr. right up his tailpipe. Well, there's, been a, there's been a lot of that. Now, these bumpers on these cars will all have to be replaced before they run them again, that's for sure, front and rear. You know, guys, right now, the crew chief, he, down there, he's a busy man. We're about five to seven laps before pit stop. He's the football coach. He gets on the radio with his driver. He said, look, we got one more stop to make. Tell me what you want to do to that race car. Whatever you do, don't get caught speeding down pit road. He gets his pit crew together. He said, guys, this is what we've worked all winter for. One more stop, just a solid stop. No mistakes, no loose luck nuts. Wow, Daryl Earnhardt went in there on the bottom lane in fifth place into turn one, but he came out in about 10th or 11th place as the lead changes hands again. The lead uh, is back to Burton and uh He's bringing Jeff Gordon right with him. And Kurt Busch, the rookie. Boy, that kid's driving a whale of a race. He's hanging right in there and doing a, a whale of a job. A lot of folks wondered why Jack Roush didn't promote Truck Series champ Greg Biffle to Winston Cup and instead fall to Kurt Busch up to the senior circuit. And Roush said last winter, it's because Kurt Busch reads a racetrack better than any new driver that I've had maybe ever. Tony Stewart just about spun Dale Earnhardt out. You heard Tony have to back oh, completely jumped. out of the throttle. He jumped out of He had a run on Dale. Wasn't quite enough room. Pit stops coming up in five to seven laps. And before they do, we'll take a pit stop for our Fox Racing coverage. Ward Burton leads Jeff Gordon in the Daytona 500. It's our life's work. 
Jeff Gordon and Dale Earnhardt may have just bumped coming through the trioval or now in the back straightaway no. without further incident. <laughs> they may have. They wasn't a may have. They did. <laughs> Earnhardt's car is going. It looks like it's been running Martinsville. He's got every corner on that thing beat up. How did anybody cut him a lot of slack today? Let's show you what happened one lap ago. He gets a rundown on the inside there. Gordo doesn't want to let him go, but... I'm going. Look, did you see him work oh, that yeah. wheel? He was man. a busy man in there. Man, oh man. Look through the windshield. Watch his hands right here. Running 190 mile an hour coming through here. Yeah, this is a lot bumping in the parking lot. Gordon just braced like he knew it was coming. <laughs> Bernard had his hands working, I tell you that. He had a handful. Notice the guys behind him, they see it happening. They ain't even thinking about backing up. And look at them stack up as Gordon and Earnhardt each lost a little bit of momentum. And Back both, live. And both of them aged a little bit, too. <laughs> a lot of gray hair in that cup garage. Races like this are one reason why. Two Dodges. Lead three Chevrolets and a Pontiac. You want to know what it feels like at a Winston Cup race? Let's give you a chance to check it out. The pictures will tell the story while you feel the power. And if you got surround sound at home, just crank it up. Step the TV down. Jason Leffler. Steve. And this is a chance for the pit crew to become the heroes on the number 40 car. Rick Relling is the jack man. Darren Wolf and Nathan Cannon change tires. Right side tires going almost good at Dick Bergeron. This is the most pressured possible pit stop under green flag at the speeds we're running this afternoon. One second lost, worth about 270 feet in races that are won by inches. There goes Earnhardt, and there goes Sterling Marlin ahead of him. Kind of with the least wheel spin got off pit road first because they all had pretty quick stops. All right, more green flag stops this time by. Robbie Gordon peels off. Going to bring only one other car with him as the leaders whip past. Kenny Wallace also pits, and Ron Hornaday, and Kyle Petty on pit road. It's Robbie Gordon's stop. You saw the wind. Oh, trouble with the right front. A bit of trouble with the right front there. Kyle said he was pit. Back to him. There's Kyle Petty's 45. Adam Petty's colors. And sponsor. Now Robbie Gordon away after a long stop. Pulls out around Ron Hornaday. Nail biting time. Green flag pit stops. 49 laps to go. Here come the leaders once again. And Jeff Gordon's going to lead a pack of them on the pit road this time. Locking up those right fronts, Larry. Steve Park is with him. So is Kirk Bush, Jeff Burton, Ricky Rudd, Mike Skinner, Tony Stewart, and a bunch of them. Dick Bergman. This has been a very, very busy pit as Gordon slid over the pit line. Had to back it up. That's going to cost him time. We've seen all sorts of crew members down here trying to make deals to come in with this car. Why? He has won this Daytona 500 every other year. To that. 99 just now pulling away a four-tire stop. He was a little loosely adjusted with air pressure and with wedge. Steve Burns. That left side tire is going on the 31. They made a track bar adjustment. He stole the car out. Skinner cannot get it refired. Trouble for Mike Skinner. The winner of Thursday's 125-miler has blown up. No, he broke a drive shaft he or something. He broke a drive shaft no. axle or stripped the stripped the axle plate or something. And they're going to push him behind the wall. Ward Burton leads Michael Waltrip, Dale Earnhardt Jr., Jerry Nadeau in, and Bill Elliott. Matt? The leader is in his pit. Tommy Baldwin on the right rear. Tommy Wallace 
Lewis on the right front. It is a four-tire stop. They were complaining about the car being a little tight off turn two. They made some slight adjustments with air pressure. His last stop was 16.7. He's down and away. Dick. Jerry Nadeau has a good stop going for himself. It's a four-tire stop, as has been the case with everybody we've seen on this end of pit road. He's gone. Mike Skinner out of the race. New leader, Bobby Labonte, led this lap first time. The Winston Cup champion has led today. 39 lead changes. That's the most of the Daytona 500 in the last 18 years. Green flag pit stops continue. 153 laps down. We'll be back to Daytona right after this. Bobby Labonte has just given up the lead by making his green flag pit stop, and so has Dale Jarrett. That'll put Sterling Marlin back in front of the Daytona 500. There's Jarrett still trying to get up to speed after his pit stop. Now, before the pit stop, here's a look at Jarrett. And you can tell what, see what he can see. He doesn't see so hot. A lot of glare. Oh, a lot of glare in that windshield. He's going to have to get one of those pair offs. And that was cars trying to get on the pit road, and he ran up on him and couldn't see him. Trouble, front straight away. Spinning across the racetrack is rookie Kurt Busch. Can he keep it down in the grass? Bill Elliott dives to pit road to avoid him. And Kurt Busch will slide to a stop. Caution is out. A lot of smoke also down at turn one from one car that may have gotten rear-ended back there. Well, that smoke abates. Look at Bush after that wild slot. Second caution of the day. Sterling Marlin is the leader. It's only been about six or seven laps since they pitted, so I don't think they'll be the pit road. There's Bush on the bottom of the racetrack. On the bottom, he comes up off the corner there. He wanted to get back in line, but guess what? Joe Nemechek was there. Ford Burton just barely getting by there in the black and yellow car. Uh, he just he just thought he had a a, a spot in line and it, it was closed up on him. Kurt Busch's car slid some 2,000 feet before coming to a halt. And there's the damage to Joe Nemechek's car. Not only has he got the damage on the left front from Kurt Busch, but he got up into the wall on the right side, and he's got damage on both sides. Only the second caution of the day. I'm thinking everything is cycled through the pits, though. I don't think this affects anybody as far as... Uh... You know who I think it does affect is Rusty Wallace and Robert Presley. Rusty, after going a lap down at lap 28, I think he has gotten his lap back. He may very well have because he could have stayed out a little longer than some of the others did. And there he comes. So I think you're probably right, my friend. Indeed. Presley and Wallace are now back on the lead lap of the Daytona 500. A race that Wallace has tried now for 19 years to win. We'll be right back. This is NASCAR on today at 159 laps. Some drivers stopped under this caution, but they were toward the tail end of the lead lap. The leaders stayed out. Let's show you what happened at turn four. Jeff Hammond. Yeah, as we can see, the 97 car coming off of turn four, and he starts working up to the outside. Right about there, the spotter should have been saying, outside, outside, but it looks like the car, he just kept coming over and got right into Joe Nemechek, and right in the wall he goes. So unfortunately for the 97 car, Makes me wonder if he was listening very closely to his spotter. We haven't said a lot about spotters today. And they're very critical here at Daytona. And I think they've been doing a pretty good job all day because this is really one of the first incidents we've had because it looked like driver error. Jeff, I talked to a couple of spotters yesterday, and they said the toughest places on this racetrack are right there, the exit of turn four, and down the short chute entering turn one because you're looking at the cars either head on or tail on for the top of the roof, and it's very difficult to tell distance between those cars front to back. That's a good point, Mike, because I got honest with you, this is the best I've ever been able to see the Daytona 500. <laughs> there are the spotters up on the roof. Eddie DeHaan closest to you, Bill Elliott spotter there on the bottom row as Ricky Craven's car is pushed behind the wall. Here's a look at where our Coke family of drivers are running in this Daytona 500. Things set to go back to green. Sterling Marlin leads the Earnhardt's junior and senior. Speaking of senior, Kevin Hamlin, Dale Earnhardt's crew chief. This is Larry McReynolds with Fox. 
I know there hadn't been a lot of strategy uh, having to pit about every 50 laps. I'm not going to ask you, can you win this thing? That's like trying to predict the weather. But what has Dale said about that thing all day? He hasn't said a whole lot of anything, Larry. To tell you the truth, he said that uh, earlier in the day that the wind down in turns one and two was a little bit hairy if he got caught into the middle, but uh, said he had his hands full doing that. Other than that, the Jim Goodger and Sirs Plus Monte Carlo has run uh, pretty decent all day. You know, he bashed in the nose a little bit coming into pits there that first stop running in the back of Shader, Schrader when they all did a brake check. So that, arrow wise that's hurt us maybe just a little bit, but uh, all in all, I think it, it's been a pretty spectacular race so far without many incidents and uh, you know Daytona is the world's greatest race and, and I think they've even somehow made it better all right Kevin I'll let you go back to business Sterling Marlin our leaders on pit road to the flat tires we go back racing Steve Burns yeah we just heard Sterling Marlin say he's got a tire going down terrible break for Sterling Marlin he's led so much they're up on the wall the tires it is definitely on the left side for Sterling Marlin rear tire off front tire back off Road. The best thing could have happened, Steve, is the field is not up to speed. Marlin will not lose a lap with this tire change. Casey Atwood back on track after a broken shock mount. And up front, here comes Earnhardt Jr. Well, I tell you what, I've ridden around under a caution like that and get a little buildup on my tires. And when I get ready to go, I say, I got a flat tire, when in fact it wasn't flat at all. It just had built up a lot of rubber on it. So uh, I hope that's not the case for Sterling. Boy, this time, Darrell, it's really split out into three different packs. Those single file restarts, so many cars on the lead lap, and uh, the front guys go before the back guys do, and you get separated. That's what may cost Bobby Labonte and Dale Jarrett their shot to win the 500. They are in that third pack well back. Race record, 15 different leaders. We've had 13 today. 42 lead changes, the most since 1983, and two cautions, the fewest since 1963. Well, look at Ken Schrader, the yellow 36, get a run on the high side off turn two. Look at Ward Burton, all the way down to the bottom of the back straightaway there by himself. Moves around Steve Parks, number one, and Burton is trying to climb the ladder without any drafting help. That Dodge is strong. Yeah, the two strongest cars I've seen all day has been the 40 car and the 22. And you can see the 22 has got what it takes to get to the front. And now he's got somebody to help him. That's all he needed was somebody to jump down there with him. Now it's shuffled off into two big packs of cars. Oh man, Earnhardt just took it. <laughs> he did not want to let Ward Burton by, and uh, guess what? He didn't get by. Schrader works the high side. Earnhardt Jr. pulls him on the low side. Watch this Dodge get legs down that back straightaway. This is like letting a thoroughbred loose, boys. And he's got some help, and when he's got help, here he comes. Jeff Gordon. Number 24 on the bottom side, and here comes Michael Waltrip up the middle. Hey, we hadn't talked about Uncle Mike all day, and there he is. Come on, buddy. Give me, give me a chance to talk about you. Getting a little bit of help from Steve Park, his teammate, and Steve goes back behind Gordon, going to the bottom side, three wide through the trial. They're racing like it's the last lap, and there's still 35 to go. Now the second pack. If they get single file, they can draft right up on this lead pack. In fact, they may catch them anyway. No, I think double file can catch triple file any day. Well, they're closing one. right in on them. I don't think we have to worry about the front pack running single file. No, they didn't run a single file very much today. Richard Petty, who's won this race seven times, has often said, the best you can do on any given day is put yourself in a position to win. Then circumstances dictate the outcome. I think there's a couple of guys back in there we're going to be talking about before too much longer that we haven't even mentioned other than how far back they are, the 88 and the 18. But, Daryl, the question is, where is that position to win from? you got to be somewhere near the front. I don't think that you want to necessarily be out front, but you got to be in contact. you got to be able to make that move down to the inside, up to the outside to win this race. And it's one pack again. 28 cars all in a bunch. Jeannie? Well, guys, you're, you're talking about that position to win. I can tell you where it is not. It is the garage. Kurt Busch went by. We saw Ricky Craven. Mike Skinner just sitting here patiently waiting. Take us through what happened to that terrible pit stop. I couldn't really hear you, but uh, I guess we broke a gear. I, the opinion snapped off, and I really hate it for our sponsor Lowe's. I hate it for this race team, but... Uh, these guys were really, really hungry. They had me in a hell of a hot rod right here. This car was pretty awesome today. And 
felt like our chances was good, but uh, we keep knocking on that door. We'll get it kicked down one day. Doing what they can to get back out. Most disappointing, he wasn't having any problems before he went into that pit. Steve? Well, Jeannie, here is the problem for Sterling Marlin. It may cost him the Daytona 500. Left front tire off of his Dodge. Puncture hole. Goodyear tire engineer says it went all the way through right there. New leader, Steve, Michael Waltrip. There's a Waltrip leading the Daytona 500. All right. Jeff Gordon on, right go, there with go, him. Go, Mikey. Go, go, go. Go, <laughs> go, baby. You my man. You my man. Let's go. Come on. This is fun, isn't it, Jeff? I, I'm telling you, I'm pulling up another, another Walter here. Come on, buddy. We got to go. Come on. Put your foot in it. Let's go. This is the best. I told you he had a good race car, guys. The man is hungry. His last name may be Walter. Don't hold that against him right now. He's a good boy. He's going for the front. Let's go. <laughs> oh, man. This is great. Three Chevys on a Pontiac. Lead the 500. Here comes Jeff Gordon on the outside. He's going to take Steve Park with him, number one, and Ken Schrader's 36 Pontiac. Well, we, we, we may not be in the lead now, but uh, we got out there for a little while. It shows he can, and that's, that's important to him, I know. 32 laps to go. They've made all the pit stops they need, and now Steve Park wants to lead. Schrader goes with him. Michael's right there. He's right late, right up under that Pontiac of Schrader. See the 22 of Ward Burton. He had fallen all the way back to about 13th here. Look at him four wide off turn four right there. And for the first time today, Steve Park will lead the Daytona 500. Robert Presley peels onto pit road, an unscheduled stop. I don't know about y'all clock, but mine's about to knock my helmet off. It's ticking so loud now. <laughs> I'm glad we had that caution there, that little caution to tighten them belts up because I think we're going to need it. battling Steve Park. Park got his first Winston Cup win at Watkins Glen last year. Pretty impressive. All three of them DEI cars up there in the lead. The one, the eight, and the 15, all three of them. And guess who's right behind them? The owner, Dale Earnhardt, Inc. That's what DEI stands for, and here's the boss in seventh place. Johnny Benson on pit road. Driving the car, he came within five laps of winning the Daytona 500 with last year. Unscheduled stop for Benson. Clear there. He's going to have a run. Johnny Benson's problem is under the hood, Mike. He has lost not just one cylinder, he has lost two cylinders in that number 10 automobile. A Hendrick engine powering Benson's Pontiac. Yeah, Junebug. Junebug's laid up in there giving Michael a good push down the back. Going to push him right out into the lead. And for the third time today, Michael Walter has the lead. And Black Three's going to follow him. And they're going to come right on right behind him. him. That inside line seems to be the place to be. And you got to protect it. Left their teammate up there in the top groove all by himself. Well, he's got a company, Ken Schrader and all, but there goes the lead. Walter, Earnhardt Jr., Earnhardt Sr., Watch that yellow and black dots, number 22, Ward Burton, and Ricky Rudd is coming up there with him on the inside. Number 28. Wonder what some piece of Earnhardt's thinking right now. She's got a team she owns, Dale Earnhardt Jr. and her husband out there running one, two, three right now. She's asking everybody how much this race pays to win, baby, right now. We run first, second, <laughs> That's right. third. How much, how much are we going to take home today? We were joking in New York. There's one fellow in that pack that knows. Ken Schrader knows how much he makes every spot he moves up and how much he loses every spot he goes back. Oh, yeah, he'll intentionally run 10th because it's a bonus for being 10. Pays more than 9th with all that bonus money. You bet. 29 laps to go. Michael Walter leads Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Sr. in the Daytona 500 on Fox. Welcome back to Daytona. It's the big one, gang. It's the big one. It's what we've all been fearing. This kind of racing is going to happen. A horrible crash on the back straightaway that began when Tony Stewart got turned sideways against the backstretch wall number 20. Jason Leffler all torn up. The defending cup champion, Labonte. Stewart, there's fire underneath the hood of Bobby Labonte's car. He's out. He's okay. This is the view. You see Tony Stewart moving inside his car. Steve Park's car demolished. 
and Stewart, Stewart's car, car really flew good. and then had a car land on it. In front of his car, the roll cage is down on him. I tell you, and, and that doesn't look good. They're running in with the safety crew. There's Robbie Gordon, and I'm not so sure that that car there didn't have something to do with the start of it. It looked like a yellow car got against the outside wall to me. Ward Burton, perhaps the fastest car here, torn up. Robbie Gordon, damage to Jeff Burton, Kenny Wallace as well. They have made it back to pit road. Dale Jarrett, here he comes down pit road, tore all the pieces. I think we could tell it, say it easier. I only see about seven or eight cars out there that does not have damage. Steve Park pounding the roof of his car in frustration. And Jarrett, for the second time in three years, is caught up in a melee. There's Mark, Mark Martin. Martin. All torn up. Let's see what happens coming off turn two. It's happened up here. I think that this car right here, man, and look at it. Is that Stewart's car? That's Stewart's yes. car. Rode right across the top of uh, Robbie Gordon's car. Robbie Gordon. Car. And I think everybody. Back up, back up and look at it again. I think that, that the four and the 20 may have been the, that started that. Stewart was the first car sideways. Here's the why. Here's the four got into the back of Ward Burton, I believe. And then Burton's 22 got into Stewart. Got into Stewart. And everybody scrambles. That car is taking a whale of a ride, that 20 car is. It's getting hit. It's upside down. It's hit on its roof. It's on fire. And here's another angle. Coming off a of turn two where we've said that it's uh, the wind. Somebody got into the back of that car that right there. That's Ward Burton yeah. right there. We saw a puff of tire smoke, and then everything left. I think that's what started. Somebody got it back of Ward Burton off I, turn two. I, I'm pretty sure the 20, the uh, four car got into the back of Ward Burton, turned him into the 20 car, and God help all of them because there's no place to go. And you can't see. Now here we come off of turn two again. Right there, see, Ward Burton got pushed around by that car, and that's uh, the four car. And he got in the back of Tony Stewart. Of course, Tony Stewart won airborne here. And it was Ward Burton's car being sideways that blocked up the track for everybody behind him. Boy, and it gets hit by every car in the field, seems like, and Tony Stewart's car just took a whale of a ride. That must wow. be at least 30 cars in that wreck. From Tony Stewart's onboard camera. That, that is something a driver never wants to hear. Here's one more angle from Mark Martin, whose car is now all torn up. It's the outside wall real hard. Gets hit again, gets hit again, and takes out the Brady, guys. <laughs> And Tony Stewart goes for one of the wildest rides in recent memory of Daytona. Kind of looks like the Richard Petty crash here, back when Richard crashed off turn four down here, standing on the Look, he's nose. got Bobby Labonte's hood. It was hooked to the back of his car as he was in midair. Both Gibbs' cars roll into a halt there. Let's give you the cars involved in numerical order. Number two, Rusty Wallace. Number four, Robbie Gordon. Excuse me, number one, Steve Park. Number five, Bobby Labonte. There is Jerry Nadu walking back. Number six, Mark Martin was involved. Number zero, one was Jason Leffler. 18, Bobby Labonte. 20, uh, number six, Mark Martin. 20, Tony Stewart. 21, Elliot Sadler. 22, Ward Burton. 25, Jerry Nadu. 43, John Andretti. 44, Buckshot Jones, and 88, Dale Jarrett. Tony Stewart is out of his car, and all the drivers involved have to take a trip to the infield care center. That is mandatory. There's Tony, helmets off, talking to the folks there. He's talking to Bobby Labonte, his teammate. As he gathers himself together and prepares to get out. But great news that he is okay. Take time right now and call a ride. 
The Daytona 500 has been halted for a devastating crash in the back straightaway. Andy Houston walking back. It was really over before it started. Uh, he and Jeff Burton, Dale Jarrett, Buckshot Jones, John Andretti. There's Joe Gibbs going to check on his two drivers. Jerry Nadeau, Jeff Gordon was involved. Ward Burton's car wrecked. Elliot Sadler, there's Tony Stewart's car destroyed. Bobby Labonte demolished. Mark Martin, Terry Labonte, Robbie Gordon, Rusty Wallace, Steve Park, and Jason Leffler were all involved in the back straightaway. 17 cars and add Kenny Wallace. 18 car crash. Here's another look. They came off turn two. Pretty sure that the four car got into the back of the 22. Daryl, I got to ask you here. What is, and I know it's happening so fast, but what is Tony Stewart feeling and what is he hearing while this is going on? Well, the, you know, probably he wasn't knocked unconscious, so he's having to having to deal with the whole thing. And when it gets silent, that's when you know you're in big trouble. It doesn't stay that way very long, but you know you've gone airborne and uh, you just hold on with all your might so that your arms don't go flying all over the place. Can't say enough about the integrity of these Winston Cup race cars, though. They've got that 095 inch and three quarter roll cage surrounding them, and it looks like everybody's going to walk away from this crash unscathed. We'll have updates from the care center when they are available. Mark Martin's car came to a rest on pit road, and he abandoned what was left of it. They're going to haul that to the garage. Another look off turn two. You know, I'm not looking at it from that angle, it almost looks like the 22 car got loose off of turn two, and that's what caused Robbie to get into him. I'd like to know what the two drivers have to say. That car did turn sideways awfully quick. Our tape producer looking for a view that will perhaps show us definitively. Now here from the blimp. Well, it's just ahead of it. Yeah, we're just ahead of it there. Wow. Now look at Burton's car. When it goes sideways, it collects up the whole rest of the field. I mean, there's cars going under Stewart's car while he's in midair. Yeah, that, there's cars. He was, he was kicking around all over the place. Let's ride through it with Bill Elliott. Great Stay low. Stay low. He has no idea. He has no idea. And no vision. He know he has no idea if there's anything in his way or not. Go left, there you are, on the pavement. Dale Jarrett. This is really tight. Really tight. The M4 on a really tight. Slowing up here a little bit. Slowing up. Come on, come on. Get back to you. Talking to him, telling him everything going on around him. Back down to turn one. Got a little run. He had to let out the throttle there. 18 still in the middle. Three wide. Hey, Chief, I got to spin here. Got to spin here. Slow down. Come all the way down. Come all the way down. Oof. All right, DJ. Go down, but there was no down. The whole no. racetrack was blocked. Talk to me. Well, Robbie, 18 car crash. This is not where you wanted to end up, but I'm happy to see that you are in one piece. Can you take us through it? Well, I just hope everybody else is okay. You know, um, I was on the bottom started to get a little tight. Tony got up underneath the ward. They seemed to slow down. I don't know if they touched or not. I got in the back of ward. Uh, then they started side, side, side by side. And um, it's unfortunate. All of us had pretty good cars at that point. All right, obviously, a disappointment. I'll let you go be with your family. And by the way, just for precautionary measures, Tony Stewart is on his way to the Halifax Hospital. Again, just precautionary measures. I'm being told that he's fine. Matt? Jeannie, Mark Martin drove his car back to pit road. Mark, your battered mount looks pretty tough, beaten up. How about you? Can you see what happened from your vantage point? No, all I really saw was smoke, and I saw the 
I think the 20 car way up in the air. And I went to the inside and thought I was going to get through there before they came down, but somebody hit me in the door and turned me around. I hit several different things, but, you know, uh, I think we were uh, we were setting okay for, with the Viagra Taurus. I think we were going to going to be able to get a top 10 out of it, maybe. Uh, but, that, you know, the fans got their money's worth today. That's all I can say. Uh, it was lap after lap after lap. And after that last uh, restart there with all those cars just bunched together like that, it just, uh, it was a it was an accident looking for a place to happen. Let's go back to Jeannie. We're going to take him here with Joe Gibbs. An unfortunate afternoon, but the good news is both your drivers are okay, but they're both inside the care center. Now, actually, Tony went to the other hospital. They took him straight to the other hospital, and I, I, they said he was complaining of his shoulder. They wanted to do x-rays on it, but uh, and it looks like Bobby's okay. I think uh, Bobby's in there and sitting up. Donna's in there with him, so looks like our two guys came out of it. I, I, I'm worried about Tony because I want to try and get over to the hospital and see what he's complaining about, something about his shoulder. All right, we'll let you go. Andy Houston is another driver that was involved in that incident. He's okay, but uh, what was it like in the middle of that thing? <laughs> well, uh, it was really over before it started. The McDonald's Ford was running great today. Had a good run going and uh, had some radio communication there halfway through the race. Uh, got in the back, worked our way back up towards the front. I think uh, everybody was just trying to get in position, you know, to, to have a good shot at winning that thing there at the end. And uh, somebody cut somebody off. It looked like about five rows up, and the um, track was just blocked. I, I, I jumped into brakes, threw my hand up, got run into in the back, and uh, pushed me into a couple guys. And uh, everybody was just spinning everywhere. So, uh, you know, it was pretty wild, but uh, we'll just go try to get them next weekend in Rockingham. I'll tell you, the cars that have come by us on the back of the record are really torn up. There are a lot of absolutely demolished race cars here, Mike. They build a special car for Daytona and Talladega. NASCAR's two fastest tracks and 18 of these teams will have to go back and build another one. Here are the cars that are involved in the crash. It appears that perhaps two or three of them may get back out to finish this race. Jeannie? Well, two or three cars may make their way back out, but Jeff Gordon, I'm pretty sure you're done for the day. Oh, definitely. Uh, you know, it tore this thing all of, all up, you know, and uh, uh, had no oil pressure uh, on top of that. So uh, I even got hit after I wrecked, uh, and I was coming back to the pits. But, you know, it's unfortunate. Uh, you know, something like that's going to happen with the, with these rules. It's great racing. You know, it's, it's exciting. There's a lot of passing, a lot of lead changes. But one little mistake, you know, uh, and, and that's what's going to happen. And it's, uh, it's, it's just inevitable. Um, but everybody did a great job all day long. It was incredible racing. And I got shuffled back there a little bit and was just trying to work my way back up through there and, uh, you know, doing things that I, even I didn't want to do. I'm, so I'm sure there's other guys that, that may have done the same thing. And I guess somebody got turned sideways up there and uh, caused a pretty big wreck. Did it happen too fast quickly here? Was it something that a spotter could have told you was coming? Well, he could have told me it was coming before they dropped the green flag today. So, uh, you know, uh, you know it's coming, but uh, you, know, you can try to keep your eyes on certain guys and, and what they're doing. But at that particular moment, um, you know, I saw smoke, saw a car get turned sideways, and, and there was, you know, 15, 20 cars or more that were right there. So uh, there, there's no getting through that. I don't care what your spotter says or where you go. It, it was just like a wall of cars. Uh, you know, I'm just glad that, uh, you know, this DuPont Chevrolet was running real well and that we were having a good day. And, you know, I think we had as good a shot as anybody, but uh, we'll just go to Rockingham. And we're glad to see you standing and glad to see you haven't lost your sense of humor. <laughs> Take care, Mike. A wry bit of humor from a driver who had a great chance to win his third Daytona 500 today. We're under the red flag. These are the cars that's on the racetrack. Most of them was not involved in the crash, but I've counted it up to about nine cars that's on pit road. Now, when you're under red flag condition, even though you're trying to repair your car, you cannot work on the car. You can make a plan, you can lay your tools out, but you can't work on it. Jeff Hammond, you ever been in that position? Oh, a time or two, Larry, and unfortunately, it happens too often in places like Daytona and Talladega because when you have a wreck, as we saw before, sometimes you can't get out of, the own, out of your own way. And one of the biggest reasons right now that we at least feel good about what has happened on the back straightaway is because of the safety of these cars. As you look at this car right here, you see this inch and three-quarter roll bar tubing that's above the driver's head. Our head restraint as far as the window net's concerned to keep the arms inside the car. You can't say enough about the integrity and the safety that NASCAR builds into what they feel like is the most safe race car right now in the world, I'd have to say. And after what you just witnessed on the back straightaway, I think a lot of you folks will have to agree with us that they do an exceptional job of learning what it takes to keep a driver safe so they can walk away from such a horrendous accident. Larry? Thanks, Jeff. 
Well, they're looking at these cars, but they can't work on them until the yellow flag comes back out. We're under the red flag. Michael Waltrip leading the Earnhardts, Kenny Schrader, and Ricky Rudd in the Daytona 500. This is NASCAR on Fox. What might have been the fastest Daytona 500 in history has been red flagged. They've just refired engines after an 18-car pileup on the back straightaway. Jeannie? Well, the good news from the pileup is that Ward Burton, you're standing here with me and you're feeling okay. Would that be a true assessment physically, obviously not mentally? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine. Just uh, disappointed. Can you take us through what happened out there? I walked over here and you kept saying, did the four car hit me? I know you haven't seen the replay, but from what you can remember. You know, we all get runs on each other with the aero package out there. You know, we, we bunch, block, hit big holes. And uh, I had a big run on the guys in front of me, but I was going to stay in line. And I guess from what I'm being told, the four car hit me. Somebody just uh, hit me and and didn't didn't use a head enough. You know, the problem is with this race, and the closer we get to the start finish line, the end of the race, the wilder it gets. And uh, I just feel bad for my team. He gave me a hell of a race car, and we were gonna have a shot at it. But now we're sitting in the garage and uh, not out there running. But for the guys that got hurt, especially Tony, I hope Tony's okay. Yeah, we are told that he's doing okay. They just took him away for precautionary measures, and you're sitting here with 17 other cars. Take care. Ward Burton had a great chance to win the 500. Now, on this next replay, watch three cars. Here they're glared. Now, this is Tony Stewart down here. This is Robbie Gordon, but watch this car. This is Ward Burton. And what happened was Tony Stewart got into uh, Ward Burton and he got Ward loose and you can't correct it right there without losing the back end. It comes around and he just... Here's another look at it. Here Robbie Gordon gets into the back of Ward right there. Gets him wobbling. And then around he goes and he turns into Tony Stewart who was right on the inside of him and that's what started the whole thing. Three car incident turned into a 17 car pilot. Coming off a of turn two over there, uh, the wind blowing the way it is, uh, you have to get up out of the throttle. Uh, you get a get a run on a guy, a guy underneath of your car, your car pushes up. You, a lot of things can happen to you right there. Matt? Well, the one guys are trying to get the Chevrolet put back together, trying to get out to gain some more points, Steve. But first off, what happened in front? Well, uh, I just like to tell my mom I'm okay because she's home worrying about me right now. But it's <laughs> the same old thing. Everything we hope we can avoid in the super speedway race. And uh, I'm really not going to blame it on the racetrack or the new rules. We had some great race cars out there that were driving good. The show was awesome. It's just always the same people causing the same problems all the time. And it's just unfortunate for this Pennzoil team because we had a great race car this weekend. And we worked, worked real hard over the wintertime to give us a car that was capable of running up front. And to go up front and lead laps and run with my teammates and run with Dale and uh, give us all an opportunity to win. It's, to have it all go up in smoke like that is just it's, it's, it's ridiculous. And uh, it's just a shame there's a lot of laps left in the race still. Well, his team is working on his car. His stops are underway, Steve. And his teammate, Dale Earnhardt Jr., just took four tires of gas, no chassis adjustments to Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s car. He has a shot to win this race. Now, the, we're, we're back under caution. That's why pit stops can take place. The car's moving around under caution. Here's the luckiest guy in Daytona Beach <laughs> coming right down pit road, Sterling Marlin. That's right. Remember when Sterling had that? Tire go down and had to pit under green. Almost lost a lap, but it put him three quarters of a lap behind the big pileup. And now Marlins back in contention. And he has a fast hot rod. Dick Bergeron. Front end of John Andretti's car is absolutely devastated. How hard did you hit out there, John? If I hit somebody pretty hard. They were already, I guess, um, spun around and getting stopped because um, hit hit one guy and then hit another guy. But when I, w I went underneath Tony, I guess, and he was upside down. You went under him? Yeah, he was upside down, and I could see him and as he passed over. I think he was on top of another car, so, um, you know, it's fortunate that we have a lot of safety in, the, in these cars, but um, all I could see then was Cheerios, and, and after the fact, I'm trying to drive back, and I drove right inside of Jeff Gordon, so um, here's a poor guy just sitting there <laughs> and drove right into him, so, um, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but um, when, when one guy or a couple of guys get together, it, it ends up that it's more than just a couple of guys. We're glad you're okay. Thanks. 
All drivers who were taken to the infield care center have been released. The one exception, Tony Stewart, who, as Joe Gibbs pointed out, was transported to Halifax Medical Center just about two miles from Daytona International Speedway for observation. Some great aerial views today from the Budweiser.com airship watching the field behind the Pontiac Aztec safety vehicle get set to go back under green. 178 laps complete, 14 leaders, one shy of the record, 46 lead changes, 18 cars wrecked, nowhere near a record. There was once a 37-car pile up here. It happened in 1960, and the cause of it went on to finish 10th. Green flag. Dale Earnhardt Jr. leads Ricky Rudd, Earnhardt, Michael Waltrip, Mike Wallace and pole sitter Bill Elliott. Now, you might say to yourself, well, these guys will take it easy to the finish. Now, just hold on to the other side of your seat. 15 cars left on the lead lap. Some of those a little bit damaged. Really, we've probably got about nine or 10 cars that has no damage whatsoever. There were 31 cars on the lead lap before the crash. Ricky Rudd hunting the lead. Earnhardt, though, on the outside, pushing his son into turn three. The last father-son 1-2 finish in this race. Bobby and Davey Allison, 1988. Look at the two Dodges on the high side. Bill Elliott in the red nine. Sterling Marlin was a lap down, or almost a lap down. He's working his way into fifth position, going for fourth. I hate to tell Mikey, but Mikey, uh, that's two Earnhardts up there. I think you're odd man out, buddy. Three Chevys fighting two Dodges. Jeannie Zelasko is with the defending Winston Cup champ. I'm with Bobby and a whole bunch of his new friends right now, Bobby Labonte. I walk over here and you're joking, so I guess that's a good sign because you said when they walked up to the car, they asked you who was the president of the United States, and what did you say? No, that was Tony. Uh, he was knocked out for a little bit, and uh, he uh, he came to, and uh, we were riding in the ambulance together, and I asked him who the president was, and he, he knew, so uh, they're going to take him on the hospital. But, uh, you know, it's just a tough break for everybody, uh, everybody involved in a wreck like that. It's uh, it's hard, hard to swallow sometimes when you're out there running and, and you get involved in something that's you know you just try to avoid all day and, and it happens and uh, there's not much you can do about it just uh, you know uh, right now we just go on to the next race Tony was complaining about his shoulder can you give us some insight to that uh, yeah he just you know he was favored a little bit but uh, he had some oil on it and, and I don't know if he hit it on the on the door bar or something but you know when, when I got to him he came to and, and you know we asked him we told him I said hey the, the car's ruined anyway you want to cut the roof off and let him get you out and he said no I'm all right you get out so you know, he got out looked like he was okay I'm sure he'd be real sore which is obvious and, and he is okay it's just that he's gonna be sore and and he beat the traffic out well, I know your plan was to hang back and avoid the mess so I guess the best laid plans even go awry sometime but it's it's good to see you're standing and you're doing all right yeah thanks thank you Sterling Marlin the 94 and 95 Daytona 500 winner is out front once again and he's going to protect that inside and they're going to race like crazy behind him and that's the car to beat everybody knows that and this is a shoot this is just like the 125 when uh, him and Earnhardt came to the line whoa look at Ricky Rudd slide up in front of Bobby Hamilton man right did there. you see Michael he just drove down in front of Dale to get behind Sterling and of course Sterling and Michael are good friends but man that's your boss buddy Michael Waltrip Ofer 462 looking to break his duck today, as they say in England. They call them duck eggs instead of yeah. goose eggs, those zeros. And look at them go. Here they come, gang. I told you, that you, you think these guys will settle down, take it easy, say, hey, everybody's going to get a good finish? No way. They're going to race their hearts out. Look at Earnhardt Jr. in the 28 car, beating on each other through turn three and four. Sterling Marlin on the low side. And here comes Sterling on the inside. And Dale's going to slam the door on him. And Michael Waltrip is back to the lead, but here comes Earnhardt on the bottom. I don't think, I don't think Mikey made it to the line in time. He's got a fast race car pushing Sterling Marlin in that silver number 40. Three wide into turn one again. You gotta have nerves of steel, folks, to see what these guys saw just now. These cars all flipping and flying through the air and hop right back out there just like it never happened. Marlin Whoa. squeezes to the middle. Michael went from the third lane all the way to the bottom, now back to the second lane. Back to the third lane. You do that on the highway, you get arrested. Well, that's defensive driving there. He's driving with the mirror. He isn't even I'm looking in front of him. He's, He's got the two Dodges lined yep. up behind him now. Sterling Marlin and Bill Elliott are post sitters. And where did Bill come from? That's not Bill Elliott. That's Dale Earnhardt oh. Jr. Oh, I started to say. Yep. 
Smoker coming off pit road. One car trailing smoke, trying to get back in it, but it's way down on the apron. Won't be a factor. 16 laps to go. And you'd think those three cars out front there breaking away from that crowd behind them, that would be a good thing. That's not a good thing. They will chase them back down as soon as everybody gets uh, lined up a little bit. You know, a car we hadn't talked about, I don't know if we mentioned him, the 55 car, the blue car, Bobby Hamilton, driving for Andy Peak. You look at him all over the back bumper, that black number three. And he's, he's, he's had some trouble today, but uh, there he is, right in the hunt. 49 lead changes today. 49 at Talladega last October. First time this aerodynamics package was put on these cars. The most of any Winston Cup race in the last 11 years. Okay, that 40 car, he's sitting in good shape. But I'm, I'm really impressed with how Michael can pull these guys around here. Ricky Rudd backing up a bit. Rudd's been packing up a bit all week. He's just not quite had it together. See, when they get lined up, though, they chase them right back down, just in oh, half a lap, down the back straightaway. That's Sterling Marlin from Michael Waltrip's race-leading car. You see this, the thing on the front of Sterling's car that don't look like it belongs there? It looks like it's a paper bag or something. You wonder if it's over the radiator opening right there. There he comes, right all the way back of Michael Waltrip, going to the outside. He's he, down low. I tell you, he better make that pass, or he's going to fall back a terrible spot. He needs some help to make that happen. None of those four Chevys on the bottom lane want to help it. Michael wants to win a race as bad as anybody out there, worse than anybody out there, and he's not going to give up that lead without a fight. I don't care if it is Dale Earnhardt and Falls. Right now, the car behind him is his teammate, Dale Earnhardt Jr. Michael's in a bind. If he lets Earnhardt by, I'm going to kick his butt. And if he don't let Earnhardt by, Earnhardt's going to kick his butt. So he's got it. He's got his. He's in trouble. Terry Labonte and Johnny Benson have just driven their cars to the garage and out of the Daytona 500. Three wide off turn four, right behind this group. It's still very dicey. Darrell, I'll just take the butt kicking from Dale Sr. <laughs> I'm going to get my 1.2 million. <laughs> well, you know, Park cost Dale a shot at a million over at Richmond, and I thought Dale would be upset about it, and he said the boy did what I paid him to do. Exactly right. Sterling Marlin getting a little group there on the high side. Got yep. Kenny Schrader and Ricky Rudd lined up, trying to make a run back on these boys, going for fourth place. All right, Daryl, if you're on the horn to younger brother Michael leading this race, what do you tell him? I tell him, don't give up the lead. Don't let him get under you off of two. And keep the door closed going into one. Guard the inside. Make him go around you on the outside. And he's fixing to get some people up there on the high side because them boys is ganging up. Sterling Marlin in silver car. For more on Sterling's car, here's Steve. Well, guys, you can see on the nose of that car, it looks like paper or some kind of a wrapper. Remember, he knocked a hole in the grill early in the race, and they fabricated a patch to put in that hose to help the aerodynamics. They put that on there early in the race. Thanks, Steve. Jeff Gordon is back in the race. Ugly car. Oh, man. Not much left of it, but he's out there to pile up some points. <laughs> There it is. Folks, you don't have one in 124th scale like this, and you don't want one. The biggest problem he's going to have is going out there and trying to maintain a minimum speed that NASCAR requires with all that sheet metal going. Well, I don't know. There's several cars driving around like that. As long as they don't get in the way, they might be all right with just a few laps to go. But here comes Sterling on the outside. Marlon's got the lead coming out of turn four, and the Pontiac of Ken Schrader is lined up with him. And the fourth Thunderbird of Ricky Rudd, the black car right behind him. There's Bill Elliott, Daryl right there behind Ricky Rudd in that Dodge. Red number nine, Elliott the pole sitter. You're with him. That's the closest he's been to the front since the race started. Matter of fact, he's supposed to be to the front all week long. Didn't run well in his 125 mile qualifying race. Had the lead for a little while and then fell back to the tail end of the line. We'll go back to him to get up on the wheel when it counts. Michael Waltrip has won NASCAR's all-star race, the Winston, but he's never run, won a Sunday Winston Cup race. And you know what? I, I, I believe Dale Jr. and Dale Sr. both are doing all they can to help Michael make that happen. That would be a good call. Everybody said, why did Dale put Michael in this car? Folks, here's why he put him in there. Great driver. Michael Waltrip leads the Daytona 500. 
Sterling Marlin in the fastest dodge. And those two Earnhardts are right behind him. And outside pole sitter Stacy Compton, 92, is in that pack as well. And the laps wind down. Ten to go. Michael Jr.'s car is actually a little bit better through the corner. Dale seems to be able to pull back up on the straightaway, but uh, those two cars in front seem to be a little freer through the turn right now. And I think that's the problem Sterling Marlin's got. Ken Schrader can pull up on him in the straightaway. Sterling's so strong through the corner, he actually yards Schrader in the corner, and Schrader can't push him on by. In 24 of the 42 previous 500s, the driver leading with 10 laps to go has gone on to win. A lot of lap traffic up in front of these guys. Cars that's running about twice as twice as slow as they're running. Michael sniffed a draft off the of buckshot zones. But boy, he's got company. There's Michael's wife, Buffy. Will that over streak end today? I don't know, but I feel like she does. I can't watch. This is a, this is what we prayed for. It's what we've all talked about. In 63, Tiny Lund got his first Winston Cup win, the Daytona 500. Mario Andretti, 67. Pete Hamilton, 1970. Derek Koch, 1990. Sterling Marlin in 1994. They each won the big one for their first ever win. And I'm, how many left you got to go? Man, we're down to nine to go. Eight when they come back. Eight to come. Now, I'm telling you, boys. Michael, you're in the best place you've ever been in, bud. Hold her there. That's a good place when you got two teammates right behind you, I can tell you that. And they want to, they want one of those cars to win, and he's in the front. Gerald, with a lap to go, does anybody have a teammate when it comes down to it? You know, it's hard to say with the aero package what's going to happen. I was concerned that Sterling was going to be the guy that would mess everything up. But right now, I'm telling you, this is the best setup he could have. See the slow car there? He's getting a draft off anything that's out there moving. Guys, one thing we need to make sure we understand here, that spotter on top of that building could be Michael's best friend right now, helping him get through this last few laps. And the 125, they had a big part in how that finish came out. Just don't get too overconfident, Mike. Keep, protect that inside, buddy. Just don't let them lull you to sleep. Keep, it, keep looking in the mirror. Come on, buddy. let's go. Let's go. Come on. It's getting close. I mean, we're down to seven laps to go, man. Seven laps to go in the biggest race in the world, the greatest race in the world, the Daytona 500. Four Chevrolets. My baby brother's leading it. Four Chevrolets lead three Fords, a Dodge and a Pontiac. Daryl, your first ever race on Fox. You think it'd be like this? I, I have experienced everything imaginable. I mean, we've had rain delays, we've had big wrecks, and now we got my brother leading the race with six laps to go. Look at the two Wallace brothers, Rusty Wallace in the blue two car. His brother, Mike Wallace, right behind him, moves down on Bobby Hamilton right there. They moved into fighting for fourth position. Well, Rusty's car has got a great big old gash in the side of it. I don't know how he's hanging in there the way he is. Look at that right front corner there. He doesn't even have a fender there. Darrell, we got six laps to go. Take a deep breath and breath. Wiggle them toes, man. Oh, man. Take a deep breath and wiggle them toes now. My poor mama, she's going to be having a fit. <laughs> you can help Mikey out here. Come on, buddy. Come on, Mikey. Let's go. You're my man. You're my man. Keep in the, just keep looking in that mirror. Here comes somebody. Who's that up on the outside there? Well, Marlon's, Marlon's lost his partners. Here comes Hamilton, 55, towing Rusty Wallace, number two, toward the front. Oh, man. I didn't, know was, I didn't have any idea TV was going to be like this. I thought it was going to be a lot of easy work, fun. This is hard work. Well, it was until about 30 laps ago. Five laps to go. Leading the Daytona 500 with five laps to go. Look at Sterling blow the apron going into turn one. Ducks back in the line just in time to get there. That he run with him. Schrader got kicked back to sixth place. Let me tell you, that's the best thing that Mikey's got going for him is those two cars behind him. you got to pass two cars to get to him. And those guys are smart enough to know Dale Jr. and Dale Sr., they cannot pull out. Darrell Waltrip won this race in 89 after 17 years of trying. He and Earnhardt perhaps best know of everyone here. The frustration that builds when you've tried so long and so hard to win one Winston Cup race, uh -oh. let alone the biggest of them all. June Bug getting a little getting a little antsy there, but they're getting heat from the back. Sterling's all over Dale Sr. Dale Sr. is trying to keep him back so they can't get to the two team cars in the front. This is a chess match. 
at high speed. Four laps to go. Single file around lap traffic. Man, those guys didn't need to be there. They should have got down out of the way. Michael Walter leads that snake down the back straightaway. I know he's a nervous wreck. Well, maybe he isn't. He's probably, he's probably as cool as a cucumber. I'm, I'm the one who's nervous. Come on, buddy. He finished fifth in the 599. This is his 15th try. He thought he was going to win that one, and he just got shuffled out right at the end. Whoa! Look at Earnhardt. He's Sterling got into Earnhardt. He's getting, Dale is doing everything he can to keep, keep Sterling behind him because Dale knows that Sterling's got a fast car. Here comes Schrader on the outside, that yellow car. Remember, Schrader's not won in 10 years. He's got the help there, Bobby Hamilton in the 55. Michael wants to see these guys just all over each other behind him. The more they do that, the more lead way it gives him. Yeah, they're not going to ever make it up on the outside, I don't believe. They can get a run on him, and they can get up there to him, but I don't believe they can pass him. Every driver dreams of winning the Daytona 500. Michael Waltrip dreams just of winning this race, any race to break that big 0 for streak, 0 for 462. I don't know if I can stand this or not. Come on, buddy. You got two to go. Come on, don't give up now. Just stay under him, Dale Jr. Just stay under him, buddy. Two to go, bud. Two to go. Out of way. The calm voice of the spotter. Look at Chuck Dale. Joyce reassuring Michael Walter. Dale has done. Sterling has beat the front end off at that old Dodge trying to get around Dale. Is there room between Earnhardt and Schrader? Yes, he gets to the outside. Then All drops right. back in line. All right, here we go now. This is when it's going to get tense, boys. This is, when, this is when we're going to find out. We're coming around for the white flag. Four Chevys, a Pontiac, a Ford, and a Dodge. To fight it out, three miles to the finish of the Daytona 500. If he can survive this run, he'll be okay. Nobody's doing anything. They're all holding. Buddy. Go get him. Come on, buddy. One to go. The last lap. One to go, buddy. Keep it low, Mikey. Keep it low. Don't let them under you. Make that back straight away wide, buddy. Get all over the place. Don't let them run up on you. Come on, man. Come on now. Watch it, mirror. Watch it. He's going to make a run inside. Block him. Block him. That'll boy. Three wide behind them. You got him, Mikey. You got him, man. You got him. Come on, man. Come on, baby. Come on. Get him in the fold. Get him in the fold. The three cars out. Oh, big trouble. Oh, big wreck right behind them. Beat him back. Beat him back. Come on. To the flag. Come on, Mikey. You got it, man. You got it. You got it. You got it. You got it. Mikey. Michael Walter wins. All right. The television dream comes true. How about Dale? Is he okay? You may have got me on Saturday, but I got you on Sunday. Daryl, is this better than winning it? No, oh, it's better. Than this is great. I just hope Dale's okay. I guess he's all right, isn't he? And he's about to get the best ride in racing. Man. The Daytona 500 victory lane. My daddy would be so happy. Man. Michael Waltrip has won the Daytona 500. Tears running down his cheek as he comes to victory lane. We'll be right back.
We're back at Daytona. You're looking inside turn three where Ken Schrader has climbed from his car and where rescue workers are helping Dale Earnhardt to get out of his car. Dale Earnhardt Jr. at a dead run toward the track's infield care center. So while his car owner, here's what happened up in turn three. Oof. Well, this is, this is huge because you go head on. And that TV does not do that justice. That is an incredible impact head on. Throws you forward in the car. Uh, those are the kind of accidents that absolutely are frightening. While rescue workers attend to Dale Earnhardt, who is still in his car, his driver is in our Coca-Cola victory lane. Here's Dick Bergeron. Michael Waltrip, 462 green flags. Finally, a checker. Does this feel as good as you had hoped? Just unconscious. Uh, thank God. Thank my dad. I love him so much. And, uh, you know, I just can't believe it. It, it. it hasn't sunk in yet. I know I would have never won without Dell Jr. So he, he has to get half the credit. And I know I never would have won without the belief in Dale Jr., or Dale Sr. had for me, and Napa, and all the people on my team. I thought it was kind of boisterous or bra bragging that we thought we could win this race. I mean, we haven't ever ran a race yet. Your brother wants to talk to you. Let's put the headset I mean, on you. We did win. Let's talk to DW. What's up, brother? Man, I want to be I want to be down there with you. I want to give you a big hug, but uh, man, way to go. I was Thank in there so and I was riding with you, praying for you, pulling for you. Well, I'm gonna, as soon as I find Dale Jr., I'm gonna give him a big kiss. Oh, you should, buddy. Oh, uh, he uh, won me the race, and you can't do this deal nowadays without friends, and he was my friend. His Budweiser Chevy runs second. He had a dream. He won the Daytona 500, and uh, he did. I'm just here to celebrate, man. Yeah, well, I know. Can I say one more thing? <laughs> God, I can't believe it's over. Uh, now, let me ask you a question, Daryl. How much better does one for 463 sound? The hell for 462? <laughs> it ain't nothing. It sounds you people a lot hung better. up on my record, I don't care. But I do know this. Me and my brother have both won the day told up 500. That's right, brother. That's right, brother. Tell him about it. All my Get up crew, on that car Gilmore. and tell him about it. Golly, Scott Eggleston, there's so many people, Dick. I know you can't go on and on, but uh, I'm going to have lots of time to thank people. Mama, I love you, Mama. I wish you were here. <laughs> I and know. my dad, I just, golly, if my dad was here, it'd be complete. This is a day that the Lord has made, and I'm proud. And I never gave up. You know, you can't win if you give up. I didn't care how many 04s I was. I showed up every Sunday and did my job. And today, I had enough help to win one of these things. Man, Michael, Michael, you know how much money you won? There ain't no telling. A million dollars. You won a million dollars. You are a millionaire. The last time I won a lot of money, I won the Winston. It paid 200000 I got half of that. I said, I'm going to build my mom and daddy a house. That cost 100 grand. The government got half of mine. I went 50 grand in the hole. So I'm not going to make any promises today. But I know one thing. What? What if? What if? I, I, I can't believe it. And I just, I owe it all, or most of it, to Dale Jr. He, he helped me a lot. And his daddy, too. I saw him back there fighting them off. I know that uh, they're both real proud of their, of me, their driver, but more, more importantly, this team that they threw together in a few months, and then they hired me to drive it, and people are like, why did he do that? He must really like him. Well, this is why he did it, because That's I right. knew I could do this job. I did, too. I'm Woo! right there for you, boy. I love you, buddy. Make sure I take it. Mike Wal Michael Walter. Go on down there and have yourself a, a big old time. Michael Walter has won the Daytona 500 behind it. A big crash ensued on the final lap. Here's the way they came across the line behind Walter, Dale Earnhardt Jr., Rusty Wallace, third, Ricky Rudd, fourth, pole sitter, Bill Elliott, fifth. Mike Wallace, Sterling Marlin, Bobby Hamilton, Jeremy Mayfield, an outside pole sitter, Stacy Compton. Joe Nemechek on the lead lap. Now, Earnhardt and Schrader did not complete the final lap, so they're scored at 199 laps, along with Robert Presley, Brent Bodine, Kyle Petty, and on back through the rest of the field. These results are unofficial. Again, most of these cars we're seeing back here was involved in that big 17-car wreck there with about 25 laps to go. And as, as, as excited as I am for Michael and as proud as I am of him, I, I just, I'm praying for Dale. 
Uh, he's back down there, and they're still working down there, so we need to worry about him. From Michael Waltrip's onboard camera, let's look at that final lap. You and the eight, baby. You and the eight. You and the eight. Chuck Joyce, Michael Stay Spahn. You. Come on. You and the eight. Oh, baby, come on. Come on. Go on, your final lap. That's Buffy, and we'll be right back to Daytona with more after this. You're watching NASCAR on Fox. senior has been transported to the Halifax hospital but no word on his condition one way or the other Dale Earnhardt was removed from his car and you see the ambulance transporting him directly to Halifax Medical Center in Daytona Beach which fortunately is but two miles from the speedway that's all the news we have if we don't get a further update on Earnhardt's condition during our telecast, tune into Victory Lane at 9 p.m. on Fox Sports Net tonight. There it looked like when Rusty ran up there through the middle, it maybe just took the air off Dale's floor and got him loose. I don't think anybody got you into know, him at all. Sterling may have gotten into him just a teeny bit and got him got him headed up the hill. It's hard to say. Uh, Here's the onboard view. Those kind of licks are the worst kind. They're sudden. Inside, inside, inside. Free wide, inside, inside, inside. So he never had a chance. The Strader was riding him into the wall, uh, so you get the impact of not only one car but two cars. Looks like right there. Maybe right Sterling, there, Sterling did get Sterling into him. Sterling got yes. into him, yes. and here he goes. Yes. And man, he's being not only is he going into the wall, but he's got Schrader riding in there with him. Yeah. So I'm lucky they didn't take another six cars with them. Yeah, but that's uh, I, I don't like that. Uh, that's uh, not the kind of crash. Uh, that's the kind of crash that hurts you. That's the kind of crash that hurts you. Jeannie? It's, it's just someone runs into someone for no reason. That's all. I mean, that's, you know, the rules are fantastic. They've really got a good rules package. Kenny, let me ask you. I know you've been throwing this question several times, and you're just getting out of the care center, but you, you made your way over to Dale's situation. What's going on there? Uh, I, I don't really know. I'm not a doctor. I mean, I, I got the heck out of the way as soon as they got there. And how about yourself? How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. Just thinking about Dale and him, guys. Can you take us through that? That those final. I don't know what there? happened. All of a sudden, we was all crashing. It was started behind me, but I got I got part of it. Thanks yeah, for the time. After seeing, Kenny, after seeing what happened today, is this kind of Ken Schrader was headed for perhaps a top five finish, wrapped up with Dale Earnhardt in the turn three wall. While Earnhardt's driver Michael Waltrip celebrates, Dale Earnhardt rides the back of an ambulance to the Halifax Medical Center. It's the irony of Daytona. It is. It's 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 the. It's the emotions of this sport. It's what we always fear. Uh, that big wreck we had is what we fear. That wasn't as bad. Those cars tumbling around like that, as bad as that looks, they're losing energy. Parts flying off of them, they're coming to a stop. But that sudden stop head on into the wall, that's a driver's worst nightmare. NASCAR and Fox continues at Rockingham, North Carolina. You'll see qualifying on Fox Sports Net Saturday, the Bush Series race, and NASCAR final practice on FX. Now next Sunday, 
NASCAR this morning on Fox Sports Net, the Winston Cup race here on Fox, and NASCAR Victory Lane every Sunday night on Fox Sports Net. Tonight on Fox, Futurama followed by King of the Hill, The Simpsons with Kelsey Grammer, Malcolm in the Middle, and The X-Files. That's the primetime lineup tonight on Fox. Let's go back down to the studio. Chris Myers. All right, it's the kind of day that a motion picture could certainly cover here. Uh, Michael Waltrip becomes the sixth driver in history to uh, have his first victory, the Daytona 500, 462 races without a win, and comes away with the victory. Jeff, a, a, a dramatic day for Michael very, Waltrip. Very dramatic. And I, you know, my heart goes out to Dale Earnhardt. He, he and I have been a, good friends for a long time, and I'm really hoping everything's going to be all right for him. My congratulations to Michael. My pick. Way to go, buddy. Way to go. I'm really proud of you. And, Kim, we can't say enough about what we saw today. Yeah, a couple of thoughts as we get down to the end of today. William Manchester has written that true heroism is, is not based on a single incident, but is built on courage and commitment in the face of the unknown and potential danger over time, a term, a career. Heroes are those who are unwavering to their calling, said William Manchester. So we've seen a winner today a young hero named Michael Waltrip in his 463rd start, who once said, no one owes me anything in this sport. I've been close, I've been competitive, so I'm proud of these things. I love driving these cars, and I want to do it for a long time to come. The voice of a hero. And the interesting thing is, these heroes are not only today, but they are for Rockingham next week and Las Vegas the week after. That is the mark of a true race and a true hero. Mike, a very difficult time right now for NASCAR. And I think that may be actually an understatement. The mood is extremely somber here in Daytona, and it was a wild mood swing in Victory Lane. It went from total elation to total devastation. Right now at Daytona, if you look behind me at International Speedway Boulevard, now normally after the Daytona 500, horns are blowing, people are yelling, people are partying, people are having a very good time. Right now, you could practically hear a pin drop. It's that quiet. The impact of the loss, perhaps it's too early to really state what it means to not have Dale Earnhardt as part of the Winston Cup Series, but if you could, speak to the impact and also the irony involved here. Well, Whit, uh, it's such a dramatic uh, impact. Uh, Dale Earnhardt, if you will, and I don't think I'm overstating this at all, is NASCAR's equivalent to, say, Michael Jordan or, uh, say, Mark McGuire in baseball. He had that much effect on this sport. He had seven championships. He was sixth on the all-time win list with 76 victories. People simply came to the racetrack to either root for him or root against him. But no matter what you say about Dale Earnhardt, he was all about winning. He was an, amb an ambassador for this sport. And 
people really enjoyed having him around. There's no doubt that NASCAR can go on without him. They've lost champions in the past. Alan Kowicki, Davey Allison both lost their lives after winning Winston Cup Series championships. But this sport will certainly be different next week at Rockingham. At this point, we don't know the full extent of the injuries that caused the death of Dale Earnhardt. But surely it is not too early to start asking questions about safety issues in stock car racing. This has come up before some of the deaths of drivers in years past that you touched on. Was there any mention made of, for example, the Hans device or any of the other safety precautions that perhaps could be taken in stock car racing? Well, with this was the fourth death on a racetrack in NASCAR in the last 12 months. Safety on the top of everybody's mind. The Hans device did come up in, in questioning of Dr. Steve Bohannon. He speculated, however, that it may not have made a difference. However, it just seems ironic. I had the chance to speak with Dale Earnhardt only three weeks ago in Las Vegas during a test about the Hans device because so many drivers are experimenting with it these days. And Dale Earnhardt's response was, He's not going to use it. He doesn't like it. He's uncomfortable with it. And that's pretty much the stance of most of the veterans here in NASCAR. The Hans device has, I believe, become mandatory in Formula One and in the kart series, and right now is only beginning to catch on in popularity. Mike Massaro in Daytona, a very tough day for everybody. Thanks very much. Thank you, Witt. Champion and former Daytona 500 winner Dale Earnhardt has died from a crash suffered in Sunday's Daytona 500. The accident occurred on the final lap of Sunday's race. The tragic news came Sunday night, two hours after the race ended, from NASCAR President Mike Helton. This is undoubtedly one of the toughest announcements that I've ever personally had to make. Uh, but after the accident in turn four at the end of the Daytona 500, uh, we've lost Dale Earnhardt. And uh, I have with me Dr. Steve Bohannon, who's a trauma doctor here in Daytona that's worked several events here at the Speedway and he can explain the medical practice that went on uh, at the accident scene and over to the hospital. Um, in a timing issue, we're here to tell you what we know. Uh, we don't know a lot. We don't know enough to answer all your questions, our prayers and wishes and our effort right now this moment is with uh, Teresa and the Earnhardt family. Richard Childress and his family, and uh, Dale Earnhardt Incorporated. But I'll have Dr. Bohannon take it from here for right now. I was on one of the ambulances that responded to the accident. I was about the third or fourth um, ambulance in. Uh, when I arrived, there were a number of paramedics already attending to him. There was a paramedic in through the passenger window uh, applying oxygen uh, by a mask. Uh, Dr. Uh, Tim Allison, who's a trauma surgeon from Flaglow County, was in through the driver's uh, window and was delivering CPR. And there was another paramedic in the window with him helping maintain the C-spine holding the head. There were a number of firefighters that were on top of the car attempting to remove the roof which was subsequently done that took about five or ten minutes during which time we uh, did CPR when the roof came off Dr. Allison and I both identified this was a a very bad situation a load and go situation we immediately removed him and transported him to the area level two trauma center Halifax hospital uh, transport time was about a minute to a minute and a half, during which time we continued CPR. Uh, there was a full trauma team there to meet him, uh, a trauma neurosurgeon, Dr. Bill Kuhn, a uh, trauma surgeon, Dr. Demiuga. There were several emergency room doctors there as well. Uh, we all uh, did everything we could for him. Uh, additionally, there was an anesthesiologist who uh, helped us uh, maintain the airway. Uh, but he had what I feel were um, life-ending type injuries at the time of impact and really nothing could be done for him. Um. 
Dale Earnhardt. The Intimidator has won an amazing 12 125-mile qualifying races in his career, including 10 straight from 1990 to 1999. In all, Earnhardt has 34 major event wins at Daytona, including a record number of wins in the Bud Shootout, IROC, the Bush races, and of course, the 1998 Daytona 500. Dale, welcome to Totally NASCAR. Great to be here. It's uh, great to be back at Daytona and try to win some of these races. Now, when NASCAR changed the rules, Dale, at Talladega, we saw an amazing, amazing race for the fans. You came from 18th to 1st to win it. Will we see the same thing here at Daytona with similar rules? I don't think you'll see uh, maybe from 18th to 1st and 4 laps, but you will see great racing. It's been... Uh, it's been great so far in practice and, and all that stuff in the Bud and the Budweiser shootout was a great race. Uh, I think it's really made it uh, more competitive, uh, better for uh, us as race drivers to be able to draft with each other and work with each other. Uh, but it's going to be a lot tighter race here at the tighter racetrack. Daytona's a little tighter than Talladega. Uh, they do need to put an out-of-bounds line down here, though, in the, <laughs> in the straightaways. Maybe three wide is the max, and four, if you go four <laughs> wide, they black flag you or something. But uh, it is great racing, and uh, Talladega was a great race for me. I don't, I don't think you can do that as well as you did did there. I don't think you can do that here as well as you did at Talladega. Today during our coverage of practice on Fox Sports Net, Larry McReynolds and Jeff Heyman and even DW said they still get goosebumps when they drive into this racetrack, no matter if it's been 20, 30 years. How about you? In 1976 when I drove in here the first time and uh, it's still a, a great racetrack. It's a magical racetrack to me. It, uh, I, I came down and drove the 24-hour race, and, and it just—it was the same for it. And, and it was a new experience for me. But the racetrack itself, Daytona, it, it's just a, a place where I love to love to come to. As if you need more practice, as you said, you were here for the 24 hours. What was that experience like? Oh, it was awesome. Uh, the, to drive the Corvettes was a tremendous uh, honor to get to, to drive with Andy Pilgrim and uh, Kelly Collins, Dale Jr. He was, he was super in the car. Yeah. But we got to race in the rain, got to race in all kind of conditions, and, and I was pretty good in the rain, too. I mean, I was <laughs> one of the fastest cars out there when I was driving the car in the rain, and I was amazed with the downforce and the rain tires, uh, how fast I went in the rain. Uh, the road course in the infield was a whole new experience. I've never been there. <laughs> I've been uh, in the pits and in the garage and up and down through here around Victor Lane, but I didn't, didn't know anything about the road course. I've never been in there. Couldn't even tell you how to go around it and what gears to use, anything. So it was a new experience when we came and tested and raced, but uh, I was really proud to do that race and excited about it. And uh, I think it's going to be something that I'm, I'm going to remember a long time and may do it again sometime. Now, how about as a car owner? You've got Michael Waltrip joining Dale Jr. and Steve Park. All three seem to be running pretty well. They are. They're running great. And uh, Michael's doing a great job out there in practicing and drafting. I want to see how he does in the qualifying race on Thursday, which I'm in that same race, I mm. think. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty neat to see, you know, your race cars that you own out there doing so well and the drivers that you feel so confident. Of course, your son's one of them. Uh, but you still, you know, I, I still feel pretty confident about my, my race car. And my race car is, is doing well. Uh, it, uh, it, um, the guys keep working better. We're putting a race engine in now. We did a, ga a gas run today and running out of gas. And with our practice engine, we got the race engine in. Uh, I'll practice with it uh, right before the race, make sure it's uh, perfect. But I think we'll be in good shape on Thursday with a with good wrench car. Did you learn anything in the shootout that you can apply to the rest of the week? Make sure my setup worked, and it did. It worked well on, on old tires. And, and to run Sackett on the tires I was on, I was pretty impressed with that, to be able to drive the car and stay where I was at on older tires than what other guys were on. And that's something that I, we all wonder, what, what is your car going to do in 50 laps? And it, it, was, um, it, was, it was just super to run that long and still be able to drive the car and, and race and be competitive with worn out tires. Hey, thanks for being with us, and good luck on the 8th NASCAR Winston Cup Championship. You get ready for Sunday. It's going to be a good race. I hear you. I am. I feel good about this, and uh, you've never noticed because you've always been working on race cars, but I, I feel this way pretty much every year until the, I don't win the Daytona 500, and it's, it's a bad time, but, you know, Victor Lane's where you want to be, and I, it took me 20 years to get there, but I do feel good. I feel better this uh, time than I did last year, really. I'm, I feel more relaxed, and then maybe it's because I've had such a great time the whole uh, 24 hours and, and this week leading up to, to the Daytona 500, the whole thing. After the surgery, it's, I mean, you could drive for another 10 years. What's your plan? Yeah, put 10 years on my career, really. <laughs> I'm, I'm in good shape, and the race cars are handling great. But 
I did get the surgery straightened out with my neck, and I had a great year last year. So I'm even stronger this year. I'm working out and, and staying in shape. So uh, I'm focused. I'm uh, determined. I'm going to go out here and give it our all this year. Do you like who you are? Do you like Dale Earnhardt? I'm pretty happy with him today. He's a pretty straight guy. He don't he don't make mistakes too often. He, he's a pretty good guy. He stays in line. He does his job. He, you know, he, he's going to get ran bunch on the racetrack, but that's about the most biggest part of it. You know, he's not going to do anything else. What are you afraid of? Oh, my wife. <laughs> <laughs> not really afraid of her. I just don't want to disappoint that's her. That's a real good answer. I don't want to disappoint her. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, but I don't know. I, I've never really been afraid of anything in a race car. Uh, the, the, the fact of fire is there always, you know, yeah. but it's not a fear. No, I, and uh, that's a concern that, that if there's a safety as aspect of racing that I worry about, it's fire. And might know you'd have to go through somewhat of one. Well, I did, and, and with Elliot and the crash, and, and, and I got burned a little bit, but that wasn't a major deal. And but uh, that I really never really been scared or, or nervous when I got in a race car. Uh, been scared when Tim Richmond was running up across the racetrack like he's gonna kill me after we wrecked in Pocono. <laughs> and uh, after you and I got into it at, at Richmond, I thought somebody were, was gonna kill me. Were you scared then? then? I thought somebody was gonna kill me then. I thought Stevie was gonna get me. I thought Junior was gonna get you too. Yeah, Junior was pretty mad about tearing his lightweight race car up. But, uh, that sucker did fly apart. But, uh, you know, you go but, through but all that. But Dale Earnhardt, other than a race car driver, you said your wife, and I, I understand that perfectly. What else? Are, is there anything that, away from a racetrack? What are you afraid of? Now, I don't know that there's really thing that I'm afraid of other than just that. Uh, seems like I want everybody to be happy. I just want, I mean, I don't want things to come up tomorrow and somebody's unhappy. Yeah. My, my kids. Well, you're uh, in the wrong business, but. Well, I know I'm talking about my kids. <laughs> you, I'm, you know, I'm talking about, uh, uh, you, know, you want all your people that work for you to be happy. Uh, I, I'm probably not the best boss there ever was. Because I'm, I, I, I'm you too, think you're demanding? too good hearted in a lot of ways and uh, I let people run things a little bit too much sometimes when I should put my foot down so now this is you know we've got to stay in line here we've got to do this but the guys are I just want everybody to be happy how do you see yourself how do you how do you feel about Dale Earnhardt a lot better I've known you a lot better so today than I did uh, several years ago uh, because of family because of my life uh, because I think I'm a, a better person than I used to be uh, i got a great wife a great family proud of my kids, uh, all of them, uh, and uh, I'm really, I've really got it all right now. I'm, I'm racing and enjoying it. I, I, I win. I'm, I'm competitive, uh, but my family, uh, every, everything's great there. And then I have some good race teams too. That my kids win races. Carrie, my uh, oldest son's there with us. So uh, got grandkids. I mean, I'm having a good time. I got it all right now, Daryl. I got it all. No, you really do. I You're really, right. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lucky man. I yeah. have it all. I mean. Uh, the Lord's looked after us, I reckon. Uh, 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 my aunt and uncle made me go to Sunday school when my daddy was racing and working, and I went to Sunday school with my aunt, and she, I reckon that helped a lot when I was a kid. That teaches us all a lot of values. You got me on the straight, straight path, I reckon. Dale Earnhardt would have been 50 in April. The man who was NASCAR racing with 76 Winston Cup victories is survived by his wife, Teresa, four children, Kerry, Kelly King, Taylor Nicole, and Dale Earnhardt Jr., who finished second in Sunday's Daytona 500 behind Michael Walter, both cars owned by Dale Earnhardt. And I'm joined now by Mike Joy, who called Sunday's Daytona 500 on Fox. Well, Chris, the pre-race was a very relaxing time for Dale Earnhardt. He was relaxing in his interviews and chose to spend that time in the morning with family and with friends, laughing, joking, cajoling the folks that he'd go out and race against.
Jeff Hammond, of course, former crew chief. You worked with Dale Earnhardt and competed against him many times. Yeah, Chris, it's, uh, it's really kind of hard to say. I mean, I was fortunate enough to watch Dale get in his first uh, car way back when we were racing at Concord, and his daddy was still helping Dale. And uh, a competitor, I don't think I know of anybody I've ever been around that epitomizes the word. The man was relentless as far as his competition was concerned. We had a lot of good times together. We, uh, we raced together on those dirt tracks at home. We used to go to his place and uh, ride in the back of his boat, go tubing together, We've done some hunting together, but through all our relationship uh, and friendship, he always was uh, a competitor. And, and did a lot for his, uh, for his sport. 27 years in Winston Cup racing, as you look at all of the accomplishments of Dale Earnhardt, former Rookie of the Year, and of course, one Daytona 500 after, uh, after so many years of trying to, uh, back in 1998, it finally happened. Mike Joy, you called uh, most of the races through his entire career, nicknamed the Intimidator, but it was hard not to like him if you met him. You had to respect him. You had to like him. The compass of this sport has lost its true north. Dale Earnhardt defined the limits of on-track behavior, and every time he pushed that limit, the limit moved with him. But more importantly, Chris, he set the standard and the goals for every driver who followed him. And Ken Squire, you saw all of his uh, Daytona 500 performances. This uh, was his 23rd consecutive start, and it's difficult to describe or put into words what Dale Earnhardt did for NASCAR racing. Well, whatever stock car racing is, Dale Earnhardt was. He was the child in the back of a pickup truck at the Charlotte Motor Speedway with his dad, watching those cars in the 600 and dreaming someday of being in Winston Cup racing. He was the teenager whose equipment was a t-shirt and a crash helmet, bumming rides, building cars, trying to prove that he could handle those short tracks in the Carolinas just as well as his father, Ralph Harnhart, did, who was a national champion. He was the guy that came along in 1979 and became Rookie of the Year in Winston Cup racing, and one year later was the Winston Cup national champion. And through it all, he seemed quiet. He became the intimidator, one who didn't have much to say, but who did it with his deeds on the racetrack. His wife, Teresa, changed a lot of that. He became much easier with the media. Until 1994, on this very track, just a few hundred feet from where he died today, his best friend in this world, Neil Bonnet, lost his life in a very similar type of crash. It seemed as if he went into a dark period for a bit. And then he's come out of it. 1997, nearly won the 500. It was right there. And then was upside down in the backstretch, refused to go to the medical center, got back in and drove the car around and finished the race. And then one year later, we saw him in victory lane. 20 years of effort in winning the race that meant the most to him, and there he was, up on top of the world. He told me in victory lane that day, yes, yes, 20 years. Can you believe it? Now we come to this point in his career. Going down the backstretch in the final lap, out in front, Michael Waltrip, in one of his cars. His son is running in second place. And two of his colleagues, two of his racing pals, are right in there beside him going for a photo finish for third spot. There's Ken Schrader from Missouri on the outside. There's Sterling Marlin from Tennessee on the inside. And as they went into that turn and he saw what was coming about, I would consider that Dale Earnhardt died happy. The irony of this, uh, Mike Joy, is just that. Gave a chance to Michael Waltrip, who hadn't won in 462 races. His son finishing second, both cars owned by uh, Dale Earnhardt, and competing to the very, very end. Earnhardt had won this race. He knew the great joy of winning the 500. And Larry McReynolds, Darrell Waltrip, and I calling those final laps somehow knew that he would protect the lead of Waltrip and his son let them fight it out among themselves and may the best man win. And that's what he was doing when he and Sterling Marlin touched and Earnhardt went caroming off to the wall. It is such irony 
that the man who celebrates as the Daytona 500 champion can't have his car owner and benefactor share in that celebration. I spoke with Dale Earnhardt this week. Uh, he said that after the neck surgery a couple of years ago, uh, seeking that eighth Winston Cup title was very important to him, and he felt like he could drive for another 10 years or so. Unfortunately, that dream has been cut short. Dale Earnhardt, who would have turned 50 years old in April, has died on the final lap in the 43rd running of the Daytona 500.